Okay, uh, good evening everybody and welcome to today's meeting of the Health and Social Care Select Committee at the London Borough of Hillingdon. This meeting is being broadcast on the Council's YouTube channel, Hillingdon London. The purpose of this committee is to monitor services provided by health partners and adult social care and review their performance. We also undertake in-depth reviews and witness sessions on specific topics and submit our findings to the decision-making cabinet. My name is Councillor Nick Dennis and I'm chairman of this committee. Uh, before we start, I have some important housekeeping for everyone present. Please, ins please ensure that your mobile phones are on silent, and I don't know if mine is, so I should set a good example and put it on silent right now. Uh, we are not expecting a fire drill, so if the fire alarm does go off, please follow Nikki wherever she goes. Please keep your microphones muted when you're not speaking, and then unmute them to speak. This is very important for those watching on YouTube, because they won't hear us otherwise. Uh, as chairman, I'll call on those to speak during the meeting, and please could people speak through me? That would be great. Okay, we're going to move on to the agenda. Nikki, do we have any apologies for absence? Chairman, we've had apologies for absence from Councillor Adam Bennett, and Councillor Hina McWana is here as his substitute. Thank you, Hina. Um, actually, at the moment, I should just say we have a slightly newly um, constituted committee, so I'd like to say as well welcome to you Sittal for coming in and joining us and, and being the Labour lead obviously June and Tony you're still here so I'm not going to thank you for being here you've, you've, you've been with us in the past but you're very well appreciated um, and I think we'd just like to note our thanks to the two committee members who are no longer on the committee so that's Barry and Alan for their work over the last year thank you does anybody have any declarations of interest before we start the meeting no we're all good thank you okay we have two sets of minutes uh, those on the 26th of April and those on the 11th of May. First of all, does anybody have any comments on the minutes from the 26th of April? Are we happy to approve those? Agreed. Fantastic. Are we happy to approve the minutes from the 11th of May? Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> Tony's, Tony's got bias regret, I think, but yes, we should still agree them. Okay, item five. Um, every single item in this agenda is in public. Am I right, Nikki? Fantastic. So, uh, that's good to know. Excellent. We're motoring through, which is a very good start. Um, so we come on to item six, which is the CAMS referral pathway review, our third and final main witness session. So um, we obviously, about six months ago, we started our investigations into the CAMS referral pathway and uh, the help the, that those young people in our borough who are suffering from mental health matters uh, are getting and it's been a really interesting review in some ways it's been quite intimidating because we've discovered first of all so much great work that's going on but also so much need that's out there for for assistance so um, the purpose of this meeting really is, is to um, get the views of, of the attendees and, and they can introduce themselves when they when they speak um, really about what is happening with Hillingdon and as it's our last sort of public witness session any ideas about improvement will be greatly accepted because Nikki will note them and we'll consider them when we're um, thinking about the uh, recommendations that we, we make. Um, from a personal point of view, I suppose, um, and obviously when you do a review like this, you, you obviously take on board all the positives that are, that are out there, but also as well you think about the areas that might need improving because obviously that's the nature of what we do. And so from a personal point of view, before I ask people to speak, I'll, I'll give mainly three themes that really sort of come out for me. Um, I think that the signposting is not good enough. We have this map here in front of us, I'm afraid those on YouTube can't see, of all the possible different help that can be got. It's huge, which in one sense you think is very good. But the issue is, what does it all mean and how do I know where to go? So I think that seems to be a big issue. So stuff's out there, but people don't seem to understand really at the time when they need it where the best place is to go. Um, the second thing um, that really has struck me is there's a, there seems to be a lot of waiting for help while the situation is getting worse. And I know it's true in all mental health issues, but I think especially with young people, um, you know, the, the longer it goes on before they get the help that they need, the deterioration and also the, the habits which aren't good for their life, maybe not, not turning up to school, become stronger. And I think, you know, that waiting for help, you know, if that could be reduced in any way, then, then that would help obviously help outcomes um, later on. And the third thing that I've, I've noticed is I think some of the communications has, have been, I describe them as overly medical, which can be read as being insensitive by those um, parents especially, and sometimes young people who, who receive them. Now, 
you know, decisions might get made, for example, that somebody is, is, doesn't meet a medical threshold to get a specific certain help, and of course that assessment has to be done medically, but for the family who are suffering and, and are having a strong time to get a letter saying that can be very soul-destroying. So thinking about how we communicate, you know, even if obviously that is the medical um, diagnosis and that's correct, but how that's communicated could be very important. So I'm going to be quiet now because those are sort of the three things that I've really sort of picked up over the last six months and uh, other members of the committee will have a chance to ask questions and make observations after our, our main speakers have gone. So um, I have an order written down which I'm going to go through. So what I'll do is I'll ask each person to speak um, and, and then introduce themselves before speaking. And, and what we will do is um, after each person spoke, um, then I'll open it up to questions for the committee for that person. Okay, otherwise, because we've got um, quite a few speakers, um, otherwise we could get lost. So first, Lisa Taylor from Hillingdon Health Watch. Can you give us a quick sort of view and impression of how things are going for, for um, in the CAMS referral pathway. Thank you, Councillor Dennis. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, Lisa Taylor from Healthwatch Hillingdon. Um, and I'm here, obviously, to um, present the views of children, young people and families that we generally hear from. Um, so um, just to pick up on, um, on the three sort of issues that Councillor Dennis just raised, um, I would generally agree with, um, with those as being sort of the main concerns that we hear about from families. Um, what I will say is that um, through the partnership working that I've been involved in, um, that there is a concerted effort to try and improve the front door of children and young people's mental health services. So um, certainly we, through the mapping exercise that, um, that we've recently done as part of the Thrive um, Network meetings, um, there is a lot of support out there, um, but in terms of how children, young people and their families know about it um, is, is a big issue, um, and it's certainly something that um, we're trying to improve across Hillingdon. So I'll leave it there for the moment, because I know there's other speakers. Thank you, Lisa. And of course, anybody, including the speakers, can come back in uh, and ask questions themselves if they want to. So, f so feel free to come back in, Lisa. Do we have any questions for what Lisa said before we move on to our next speakers? No, nope, we're happy to move on to our next speakers. Um, next, I'd like to ask um, Dr. Ritu, Ritu Prasad, who's co-chair of the Healing GP Confederation, to talk about how GPs view the situation. Thank you, Councillor. I think you've kind of summarized what GPs feel and that's what we have to convey to parents as well and it's supporting them. Um, there's lots of services around. It's how you get people to the right service and it's the waiting time. Sometimes you can feel the pain in the parents that come to see you but there's no way of escalating or getting them seen and other than getting them seen at A&E which is not the right route for children. Sometimes you feel that the hand, your hands are tied and you feel for the parents. But having said that, there's a lot of work going on to improve those connections, and I think the only thing I would add to your three things, there's the service signposting is really important, but also there's a lot of voluntary, very good voluntary services, and different organizations have services that are running, but it's the inter-referral pathway which could ease the pressure on certain services when they are in crisis. But I think you summarized what our sort of uh, worries are when we are seeing children and young people, especially when you start seeing the pattern and it's getting worse in front of your eyes and you don't feel you can do anything about it. Could you expand on the inter-referral pathway? I mean, what do you mean by that and, and in what sense, how do you think it could be improved? So I think, uh, for example, there's, uh, there's art therapies, there's a lot of council-led services, well, early support services. There's Harlington Hospice doing bereavement sort of counselling. But if they get stuck and they feel that they need specialist help, they should be able to reach out to say CAMS rather than it going back to a GP and then going back because then you sometimes lose the, the kind of meaning in all this translation and that can also delay things. So it, it would be, and as in Hillingdon we do work very closely together so that's something we could really improve on and have that communication between organizations. So look, this is what we've done, this is how far we can go, but now we need help, so could you take on after that? 
and that would really improve the pathways and also the relationship that we've already developed within our services as well. Uh, Philip. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Dr. Prasad, a uh, uh, question from me around um, generally what you're talking about in terms of the level of provision and knowledge thereof in terms of referral. Uh, one of the things I've found over the years is it's very difficult actually to pin down how we are progressing with CAMS. Uh, this isn't the first review we've had. I've been party to others in the past. And I wonder if you can give me a sense of your perception of how things are progressing, or indeed if, if, if they're pro progressing. And if there's a problem now, is it really one of awareness of what's out there and appropriate referrals, or are we still talking about there's not enough out there for people? Is it more about, well, we need to understand it better, communicate it better, and improve the way we refer? Would that be a fair way of putting it? As I can answer as a GP, what I face sure. with children. Yeah. So, yes, there is a, the demand has increased. Certainly after COVID, you're seeing a lot of anxiety and problems within school children because they've been away and they've been socially isolated. So I think there is a great demand. I think we have service, but we need more of the services and more sort of quick access to services when things, you can see it escalating and that's the communication, but the demand has increased and the service are not enough, both of both. So it's a bit of both still yes. then? Okay. That's it all. Um, thank you. I kind of um, sense the, this feeling of helplessness that's coming from, from, from the GP sector, um, and I just wonder if there is in my experience, they're it's stuck because people feel often that they're batted from one place to another, to another, to another. And just kind of, in your experience, how can we, can we alleviate that? Because when you're a parent with a child or with the child in that space, that going from one space to another to another can be soul destroying because there is a lot out there. There may not be enough because demand has increased, but there is a, a lot out there. But you don't know which one fits and it's really difficult to be batted around and, and find that this is not good enough or that's not good enough or that's not good enough. Um, and how can, we, how can we make that better? I think one way is the intercommunication between different organizations. So at the end of the day, it's the child that's the center of the issue, and that, that child should not be forgotten. So they shouldn't be made to feel that, one, they're not good enough to be seen by anyone, and that should not be the case. But it's also a communicating right from the beginning, look, this person is going to help you get this far, and if, there's a, if your problem's solved, that's fine. But then if you need more help, there is more help around, and you will be you will be uh, your your care will be escalated to another person who is more qualified to deal with or more complex because sometimes nipping things in the bud helps and they may not need it so it's using the services that we have appropriately so giving the chance because I can understand from Cam's point of view they must be inundated with referrals as well so it's it's just dealing with the demand how do you get people seen quicker and whether it's by a community organization or a voluntary organization, as long as the child is needs is addressed, I think that's key, and communicating it. I think communication is the key. Um, Rita. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is probably to Dr. Passad and Lisa then, um, following on from what Councillor Pooster has said as well about how can we communicate. One of the things that we'd found on our previous um, investigations was that the communication between the different departments was lacking so the child has been referred from A to B but A hasn't communicated with B very well and then it's, it's almost like a handoff I've passed you over to B now it's not my responsibility you deal with it and that's where the parents frustration is and where the child's frustration is has that improved or is it still are we still in that sort of situation where it's quite difficult for anyone to get any answers from anywhere I, I don't know if that's improved. All I can say is I've been hearing less from parents. Um, but I couldn't necessarily say whether that means there's been an improvement or they're just not contacting us. Um, I, think, I 
think just to sort of echo what Dr. Prasad has just said is that it, it's about, I think the issue comes from a child might be referred to CAMS, for example, but then they might need to be referred again. Um, and there's a waiting time, there's, that increases the waiting time, and it's not necessarily uh, what I hear is parents don't understand the process um, and why that's happening. Um, but yes, I haven't, uh, we haven't received any sort of feedback for a while, so um, yeah, there could, there could well have been some improvement in that. I do follow up on that. So whilst we haven't received any feedback, or yourself haven't, have you actively gone out and sought feedback then and asked from parents then, you know, how did you find the process? That's something that I, I want to do this year. Um, I did go out recently um, to talk to parents of children with, uh, with SEND, um, some of whose children have been referred into, into the CAMS service. What they did say to me is that um, understanding the referral pathway, um, th what they found the referral pathway confusing, they didn't necessarily get a referral straight away, um, and then, you know, in some cases, some people's children had then been referred to a different service that was more appropriate for their needs. Um, but that that waiting time was, again, it was it was a long wait, or they felt it was a long wait. Um, so yeah, so that's sort of that's that's what I've done recently in terms of seeking feedback. Yeah. Um. Dr. Prasad, just very quickly on sort of roughly sort of following on from that, um, Lisa and her team and others, Jane as well, produced this really fantastic map of, um, you know, different types of services and, you know, and, and the type of services they align to. Um, so obviously when people are really don't know where to go, quite often they do go to their GP because that is their help in the community. Um, but when, when they go to their GP, are the GPs aware of all of this stuff and are they aware of how to think about the problems they're being faced compared to the different types of help that are being offered here? So I'm in a privileged position because I do get aware, I'm aware of all these services, but it's, it's, it's not communicate. I don't think all GPs would be aware of this. So I think one of the answers is maybe a single point of access where you could go and then you get signposted to the appropriate service. That may be another solution because then you can, according to the referral, it could get signposted. But most GPs are not aware of all the services that are in the community. June. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Dr. Mustafa. Some of the concerns that was raised, especially by the schools when we had a witness session, is in regarding uh, GP's referral and what um, to, to boost that child um, being referred to CAMS or for CAMS to take that specific referral as a serious matter for the child. And that came over because um, some GPs are not aware in regards to how or what input they need to to um, add to the referral letters to CAM to enable that child to get quick access. Hence, so sometimes that will result in a very long waiting list so that child can wait 18, sometimes going a year before they can actually get a referral or be seen by, um, by CAM to assist that child. Can you, can you tell me if that is, you said you are more in tune with everything, but what about from your, your network of GPs? How much are in tune are they, and, and have they feedback anything to you on that specific issue? I think most GPs are aware of the referral form and what needs to be filled out. Sometimes you struggle because you may not have enough information from the school coming in because that may be needed. But as a GP, you would have assessed that that child is in need, and you can make that assessment while you're waiting for that. So hence the referrals may be, may be incomplete because it takes time for the parent to go back and get that kind of assessment done in school. But from the GP assessment, I think it should be a trusted assessment that a GP has made that assessment, so a referral would be warranted while you gather that information. So the referral form, every GP is aware of what needs to be put on. But obviously sometimes more information is needed which is not within the hands of the GP because it's maybe a psychological assessment that needs to be done in schools 
every school is different in what services they are able to provide and what sort of whether they have got school sort of tutors who are geared up to make that assessment, whether they have access to a psychologist who can help with that. So that is what delays it. But from a GP angle, I think most GPs are aware of what to fill out in that, but it may not be the case. I don't know how uh, from your end, from CAMS, you feel that the referrals are filled out. But the GP would fill out the assessment, or of their assessment, the parents' concerns. And if the child is old enough, you would add that on to the, to the referral form as well. Where you need more, that's where the challenge is. Thank you, thank you, Jean. Um, Philip's got another question, and after Philip, we'll move on to CN Tina and CNWL for, for them to give us their thoughts. It's more of an observation, actually, because you've, you've kind of made my point, but I think it's an important one, and I think Dr. Bassard has acknowledged there is a variable level of understanding of interventions that are available out there, and I just wonder if there is perhaps in some cases almost a default position to a, a, a CAMS clinical referral, perhaps in the absence of any, any other information. And I would uh, urge that we take that away as one of our points moving forward. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'll, I'll simply make that point and leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tina and CNWL colleagues, I'm going to hand over to you, and then you guys can talk to us as you wish. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think Asa and I will do a bit of a double act. Um, so I'm Tina Swain. I'm the Service Director for CAMS and Eating Disorders. I'm Asa Mohammed. I'm the Clinical Director for CAMS. Um, so we have the, um, the privilege and the responsibility of, of overseeing the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services for Specialist CAMS, so what used to be Tier 4. Um, and in the context of Thrive, it's, it's getting more help, getting risk support, so in terms of the domain. But we also um, support a range of services looking at getting help, so mental health in schools, and um, more recently we're looking at the R's roles. So um, that's our responsibility and our remit, and we've been fortunate enough to, to present in front of you previously. Um, I think it's fair to say that, that the experience of children and young people is really different post-COVID and we are seeing that both professionals and parents and carers are having to work with their child and young person through a range of difficult mental health and wellbeing needs. Some of that is directly attributed to COVID and some of that is, is, is just normal age and stage that you would see with children and young people. So um, I'm really heartened to see the number of services that are available for getting advice and getting help. I think it, it's absolutely within our gift to think about how we can get that messaging out there to, to children and to families and the range of options that we've got available to us, both um, from a technological perspective, so things like apps, um, but also I'm just thinking about things like newsletters and posters and, and so that we're not, we're not reliant on say a family having to go to a GP to try and get advice and support we, we, we put a range of services out there and I think a take home for me is we do have a single point of, a, of referral um, our, it's called our SPA it's a 24-7 service so I guess I'm curious about how we publicise that um, and make sure that parents and, and um, concerned family members and indeed young people are aware of it um, so I, I think it is all within our you know, we should all be doing more to support. I'll stop there. Um, yeah, where um, Hillings and Cams gets about 150 referrals a month. So they're probably seeing about, I don't know, 40 children every week, 40 new referrals every week. For a staff group, which is pretty small, uh, I, I, probably it's equivalent about 12 people working full time. So about twelve. So, so that that enormous pressure on CAM. And and of those, you know, forty a week, you know, we, we have really robust processes in there. Most children are seen uh, by about six or seven weeks. So it I can absolutely say it's a myth that people are waiting a year or, or you know, people People aren't even waiting 18 weeks, which is the national sort of minimum. Um, people are getting seen, uh, the vast, vast majority, 
are being seen within 12 weeks. There are some that 13, 14, 15 weeks. So we, you know, we, we are trying incredibly hard. Um, the weights, so there are weights, and the weights are for specialist assessment. Um, so our first assessment, you know, will be a thorough uh, assessment, history, examination, and, and care plan. And the care plan says actually um, you need a more special assessment for, you know, a neurodevelopmental disorder or, or other thing. Then that takes a bit longer. Um, and then the, there there is also going to be uh, a waiting time for um, treatments. The treatments, um, Hillingdon is is the first and uh, and the best example of of what we've talked about in this committee before of uh, the, the intervention of goal-based interventions where you see someone quickly, you do a generic piece of work, you know, that there are common themes that are in most mental health problems, whether it be coping with stress, parenting, good sleep, et cetera, et cetera. So goal-based interventions, so the child decides, or the child and family decide a goal, you do six, seven, eight weeks uh, of that, you do that early and you reduce the need to get onto a specialist treatment pathway by about 40% there and then. So that, that's been evident. We've done uh, quality improvement projects and we've sustained that figure. So that, that, is, that is a good news story. Um, I, I, I'm not going to disagree with this, this idea of um, we need to be better at um, you know, marketing and, and uh, advertising and signposting our services. So with the ICB, we've done a big piece of work with uh, the primary care component of uh, uh, drawing up clinical decision trees. So a child comes into a GP uh, with X, Y, and Z problem, low mood, they're a bit active, etc. So we've developed with the GP uh, decision trees where the GP follow certain things, you know, make sure you, you rule out, you know, uh, physical causes, etc. Um, and then they're able to make a, you know, and then you're given options as to where, um, you know, where, where to refer on to this. One of those options is CAMS. There may well be other options which are highlighted in your, um, on your kind of uh, mapping. Um, and those, those decision trees, which we've done for about six or seven disorders now, are on the ICBs primary care website, I, I'm not in the ICB, so I'm, I'm looking to my ICB colleagues to confirm that. Um, so, you know, ag again, th I think that that's hopefully another way where the GP, we don't expect GPs to know everything, you know, every single service around, but um, if that's the main source of referral, that's where, you know, we want them to have a one-page document or, you know, uh, a web page that they can scroll down, follow it, uh, and, and make sure that there's... Um, you know, good, uh, good interventions there. One of those interventions is using, you know, really uh, well-developed apps and, um, you know, digital services, coos, uh, etc., which we've also commissioned. So I just wanted to give a flavour of. Uh, I'm, I'll absolutely acknowledge that there's, you know, a long way to go, but I think, you know, we're pulling different pieces together to form a coherent uh, path for young people. Thank you very much. That's, um, I, that's really fascinating to hear about the clinical decision trees. I think that sounds like a really positive idea. And it's something that we've been definitely thinking about is, you know, getting people to be told where to get the best information and the right information um, as quickly as possible. And we talk about mental health. Obviously, mental health is huge and, and variable, and, and uh, uh, which is possibly why there's all these different groups out there helping different types of people in, in different types of situation. So my, my question, I suppose, one of the things that I'm, I'm interested in, I, I sort of called it self-triaging or the triaging process. And so obviously the, this clinical decision-making tree sounds a bit like that. Um, but obviously to have that with the GPs, I think is a really great idea. I would suggest probably having it even with yourselves is a great idea. So if somebody... The, the, the complaints haven't necessarily been about delay in when they've been seen. The complaints have been been seen and got a letter back saying, you don't meet our medical threshold, full stop. 
and then that leads to, as far as the parents are concerned, they get they have to go for another system, maybe go back to you guys, or wait for deterioration, or whatever whatever's going on, and and, and that's where they talk about the the delay. So I think you know information from you guys as well. This clinical decision making tree could be useful, and then also for schools. So I'm quite interested in that idea of expanding that to the different places where we have those pinch points of people going, I need help. And even if it's the case of we cannot help you, like we spoke to some volunteer groups and, and, and some, they, you know, they can help on some things, they might not be able to help on something. If they understand, well, actually, no, if you go over here, um, um, that would be useful. So, I mean, does that sound like a potentially good thing to sort of link that clinical decision-making tree with, you know, where to go? So, um, if I could just say, if, if we as a system are truly Thrive informed and we use a Thrive narrative, there should be no wrong front door. Um, so, the idea of right time, right place, right person should absolutely be based on the needs of that child or young person. Um, and I, I, think, I think it's going to take time for, for people to socialise that thinking around what Thrive genuinely means for us as services, but certainly um, from, a, from a CAMS perspective, our, our single point of um, assessment, so our SPA, anyone, so a young person can ring up themselves, um, a parent can ring up on behalf of their young person, it's, and they will be given advice, support, signposting, referred on to specialist CAMS if they require. So I think that's quite a good example of no wrong front door um, and that's something that that is certainly working within the context of Thrive and I think we've just got to all understand that that's the new way that we're all looking to work. I'm taking that, I'm taking that phrase for the report. Um, but that, no, so that, that, that is um, good, good to hear. Um, and I, and I think you know, and obviously, just to sort of pick up on a point that that you mentioned earlier. I mean, we're going to put good news stuff in the report as well because it is about sort of explaining what's going on, as well as sort of thinking about you know how we can go further as well. So it is good to hear about those things. So, my last question before I open it back up to committee make members taking chairman's um, prerogative to ask all the good questions first, potentially. But um, in terms of feedback, CAMs get and how they deal with it. Now, an observation that I have is when people have negative experiences with CAMs it's all wrapped up into their negative experience they're having in their lives. And so it can get very fraught and very confrontational quite quickly. And, that, and I think that is understandable in a sense if you look at the whole picture of, of the stress that the, the, the people who might have complaints are going through. Um, a while back it was mentioned this idea of having um, sort of a parent support group. Uh, which I think is an absolutely fantastic idea. So I want, I want to sort of know if that's still going ahead. But secondly, my thinking is that that sort of parent support group is probably a great place to give some good feedback to CAMS about how CAMS is working in a, I was going to say, more constructive way, but in a less confrontational way, such as how are your letters, how, do you, how are people getting information, what do they need, and also for those parents who essentially might have a specific issue but are upset you know, it's, it's a good, interesting place for them to go and speak to other parents who have experienced it in order to explain their situation. So my, my first sort of point past that is, is that definitely going to happen, that sort of parent support group thing that's been mentioned before? And, and if so, um, I would suggest that that's possibly a very good way of using it. So the, um, the, the, the parents group uh, does happen, and it's been happening for a long time, so this is more a, it's a parent support group. It's run by a family therapist. It's open to anyone who, uh, any parent who is, uh, has a child who's even been referred, so they're not, they don't have to be in therapy. Um, and uh, it, it, is, it is a place where, um, it is a place where uh, us clinicians go, uh, you know, uh, and we may present a topic, so a clinical topic, and then people can ask questions around that topic, um, but also to get feedback. Um, as, as importantly, if not more importantly, we have really strong uh, um, young person participation groups as well, and we have a you know lead participation uh, worker who coordinates, uh, you know, from one of the boroughs who coordinates all the other workers, 
and and we're we're strong believers in co-production with young young people and their families now. So we've myself and Tina have uh, put out a challenge to uh, all our services. If if you are developing new services and you don't have service user involvement, we will, we will not back it. You know we 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 want that front and centre. So all our quality improvement projects again have have that as a as a requisite that there's service user involvement. I was talking, you know, I was heard, I was, um, uh, told about a QI project quality improvement project today about um, improving discharge rates. Um, and the first thing that the, that group did was that they talked to parents about the anxiety of being discharged, you know, and feeling that if can't discharge me, I'm going to be falling off a cliff edge, and how that can be how that can be managed, etc. So, service user and parent and young person participation is absolutely front and centre, and has been for a while now. Thank you. That's good to hear about. Sittal, would you like to ask a question? Thank you, Chair. I maybe a bit of round up and a question as well, if yeah, that's okay. Um, thank you. Um, wow, well, I've got to say that's an enormous amount of people that you're seeing um, in a week, and the amount of referrals. You've said that the increase has it's increased since COVID, understandably, but that is a lot of pressure on any kind of service. Um, and so, for me, one of the first things. One things that came in is capacity and resources, and how um, how you kind of are looking at building up those resources, and if there is a need to build up those resources. Um, the other part that I wanted to kind of address here is we, there's a lot of pressure again on the GP services because they're the point of referral that comes in, and I love this clinical decision trees, and you know that that kind of it's really it, it feels really good and, and innovative in that sense. Um, and I wonder, because schools are the first places where children actually assemble themselves into these patterns of behaviour, it, sometimes it's not at home. And I wonder whether they are, there is an option there for something like this so that they also have this ability to refer. I don't know if that occurs right now because it feels like it all goes through the GP system and whether schools can have, you know, whether that can be working in schools. Um, so that was the question um, and the other part of it was what happens to those children who don't meet those medical needs where do they go because it's those people who we're going to have we have more and more of them because of the post-covid um, let's say impacts and that where yeah where do they go where are they signposted how are they signposted and that may be where the clogging happens and they are pushed from pillar to post um. thank you for those questions um so i will start from the top so in terms of um, capacity and resource, we are doing a piece of work um, within CNWL but also working with the wider system around understanding what the capacity needs are, certainly from an out of borough perspective. And um, as, as Dr Mohammed said, referrals are continuing to increase at the same time as the size of caseloads are growing. So um, we are looking to see how we're able to meet the the new um, demands on services and and what resources and support that we need. And it's, so there's there's certainly an element for us in terms of CNWL, but we are part of a wider system. So what exactly this conversation really? What does do, what do we need as a system? What does Hillingdon need to be able to meet the needs of children, and young people? What we want to do. Is, is to stop them getting to the point where they need specialist CAM services. That 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 would be a gold standard service if if there were if there were very very few young people that were requiring that level of support. So it's about how we work and engage with voluntary sector partners, with um, other suppliers of, of services, so that we're able to offer a range of services because it's 
it can't just be about growing the specialist CAM service. It's got to be about that, that sort of wider offer. I don't know if that's answered your question, um, but just to assure you that there is the piece of work looking at capacity and resource. Mm. Um, and then your next question was in relation to GP referrals and pressure. Did you want to? Um, so schools, schools are are our second biggest referrer. So it usually goes something like uh, GPs, schools, the local authority, children's services, uh, and then you know you'll, you'll get self and you know those kind of things. So schools are a huge um, source of referral. Um, the 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 long-term plan, the government's long-term plan, talks about mental health provision in schools. So that that has happened. So each school will have a uh, mental health lead, usually one of the teachers who's taken that role. But similarly, there's what we call the uh, MHST, mental health in schools teams, um, are well established in uh, I don't know how many Hillingdon schools, but you know they're established in there. So. Um, and they have a they have a much shorter criteria of needing to see people within four weeks, ideally a lot less. Um, but so 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 they are and that they will be for the lower level um, mood and anxiety and and you know sort of uh, behavioural difficulties. Um, and you know their their the training is to offer you know sort of a robust assessment and shorter term interventions, you know, using very uh, clear um, packages of care, um, which um, usually, you know, sort of uh, usually help, uh, you know, w with the idea of that preventing um, further referral. Um, and it kind of goes back to your question of uh, what, what happens to the young person if, if you know, CAMs, if they don't meet the threshold for CAMs, for example. So. You, you've got a mapping of the services that are around, um, and going back to Councillor Zens' uh, observation, I would be very disappointed if our clinicians said, actually, uh, this isn't for CAMs, full, you know, and put a full stop there. We we are very, you know, clear that we want you to suggest an alternative, uh, you know, and signpost elsewhere. So, you know, there, there's, there's a range of the, the digital and early intervention offers both in the voluntary sector, schools teams, you know, and, and you know, sort of even, you know, uh, counselling services that are around that um, that we that we signpost to. Um, but absolutely going back to our GP colleagues, you know, can those agencies talk better? I I'm sure they can rather than saying actually go back to the GP and refer yourself to this place. Uh, you know, I do think there, there is a piece of work that could improve that. Sorry, this doesn't have to be answered straight away, but just might be put out to the pool of other questions. But I do wonder that we have such a diverse population in Hillingdon, and there, and how different groups um, relate to mental health. Because I know in some communities, mental health is taboo and having that kind of access and how that information then gets into those communities as well because they don't understand it, they don't, they don't relate to it, they just want the children to get on and then see it as bad behaviour or whatever and then the ch children get isolated. So I just kind of, how, how does that happen? That doesn't have to be answered straight away, it's just, an, just something to put out there for any of the other questions. Okay, so I'm conscious of time. I know Philip and Tony put their hands up, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask um, the integrated care board, so Jane and Richard, just to give us their thoughts, and then Philip, I'll come to you, and then Tony after you for, you, for your questions. And, you, and if your question is direct to CNWL, please, Philip and Tony, do go for that as well. well I, I was just going to add to the, the wealth of information that you've already heard, and, and I remember when we came in January, some of the issues that you were raised, so signposting. So. We've, we have a number of things that we now need to take forward, and I think that is a challenge for the system about how best do we get the information out to all of the people that need it to know that what the, what's, up, what's there and what's possible. Um, we've just, I think Lisa and I today, revised the map, and I think we're thinking our next conversation well, how, how do we get that information out along with the decision trees? Um, 
with regard to um, triaging, I think the other thing I'd add in Hillingdon that we think is a really useful thing that CNWR have really supported is the work we have that's being done with our local voluntary sector, so with P3 and with the service and other sort of voluntary sector partners as well. And what that's doing is providing the voluntary sector to bring forward cases that they feel they're concerned about, to have a conversation with the clinicians about what, what can we do. And it's really helping to improve that communication and understanding around where, where the specialisms lie, who does what. In fact, today there was an email going on from one of our members of Thrive asking and reaching out, one of the consultants actually, reaching out to the Thrive colleagues to say, can you please just help remind me where this service is delivered from? So I think we have to keep building on Thrive and building on that communication. Um, so I think the tri that triaging offer was sadly stopped during COVID. We've restarted it, and I think that's a really important thing to, to move forward with. The, you mentioned the, um, the, how do we make sure that we're supporting the needs of the diverse communities, and you may remember when we came last time we spoke about we've been successful in getting some funding, particularly to support that area of work. And we're in discussion with Healthwatch and other colleagues about how we can ensure that we hear the voices of the different communities. That's there's been gay, transgender, bisexual, young people. That's people from different black and minority ethnic communities. And what is it that they would like services to um, offer differently? Um, so I think there is, if you like, this is an ongoing piece of work and we have continued to see the needs of, continue to see this as a really important area of work. My last, the last point I think I'd mentioned, today at a meeting across North West London, we were talking about a particular group of young women, a particular group of the population who are coming forward, who are young women who are, who are being diagnosed with autism or particularly maybe having eating disorder issues. So I think some of what we're saying is COVID so there's the COVID impact, and then I think there is the new, the new scenario that we're seeing is there is more need that we need to get better at addressing. And I think working together in Hillingdon, we've got a good basis to do some of that work. So I'd like to, see, I'd like to think that Thrive continues to be supported with Tina and with other colleagues to make sure that that is a language that we're having in our schools, within our GP community, and indeed with the mental health services that we offer. Thank you. Richard, do you want to add anything? Or? If, if I may very briefly, just, just supporting what, what Jane and colleagues have said, um, I think that, that we really welcome the inquiry that the committee has started and welcome the evidence that the different professionals and organisations have given. Um, and I think the point that you are making about the resistance among some of the families um, is also really an important point to make. Um, I think in some ways the complexity of conditions that we're talking about here, um, we have heard in other areas and in other conditions, and I think the dial has also been turned up uh, post-COVID. Uh, we've, we've heard that this evening and in other places. And I suppose one simple approach that may be too simple maybe something about taking the complicated map that you showed us, Chairman, and, and perhaps looking at a, a simple version of a tube map, or simply showing um, how services interact and interlock with each other, um, and that this is one way in which Hillingdon is determined to strengthen families, to strengthen the support that um, parents and families and young people themselves can access um, because in a way that's the message that we're, tr we're trying to put across, um, whether it's childhood immunizations, uh, whether it's access to primary care, uh, whether it's knowing where to go when you need help. Uh, there's something about knowing the range of services that are available to help. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there and I really welcome the inquiry. Thank you, Richard. And um, actually our next agenda item is about the family hubs. So I can see Sandra and Claire listening intently, so I'm sure we might cover some of this. Um, I'm conscious of time, so definitely Philip and then Tony will be able to ask their questions, who, whoever they want. Um, and then after that, does anybody else want to ask another question, or are we happy to move on? Okay, we're happy to move on at this stage. Okay, so Philip first.
thank you. A couple of things. I mean, <clears throat> um, and I guess this is all I guess from CNW as well, but others may want to chip in. Uh, we're hearing six to seven week waiting time rather than 18 weeks, so if I heard that correctly. If that is the case, and Lisa hasn't fallen off her chair, so I'm, I'm, I'm taking it that she'd broadly go along with that, then that's good news. But if six and seven weeks, it's still a fair amount of time to wait. And I just want to make sure I've understood correctly what I've heard today, that in fact, if people are waiting that length of time, is there anything available to them to support them in the meantime? Or are we still not in a place where that's, that's an issue? That, that's my first question. And the second one is how we go about validating the effectiveness of the interventions uh, that have been carried out. You know, what kind of, you know, do we have people come back into the system? Are they broadly effective? So how's that done? And that could be to anyone who can comment, really. Please. Thank you. So I can confirm that you did hear right, that um, children and young people are generally waiting um, around six weeks. I've got some figures from today, and it's uh, so five weeks is, is the majority, which again is fantastic compared to where we were a year ago. And what I would say is our referrals have doubled from last year. So we are clearly working more effectively um, in terms of our triage and, and our assessment process. What we do pride ourselves in is we have an initiative called Waiting Well. So where children and young people are on the waiting list, and we know that they may have been seen and assessed, and they may, as, as Dr. Bahamid said, require to go onto a pathway for treatment, we know that there will be bumps in the road for them. And so at any point, they are able to contact us to let us know that things have got better sometimes or that indeed the family needs additional support. So we can put additional layers of support in for them and review where they are on the waiting list. Um, the other thing to say from a mental health in schools perspective, they're generally seen in, less than, in two weeks or less. So if a young person is on the waiting list for specialist CAMS, and things are difficult, they may reach out to their mental health in schools practitioner or part of the partial care team within schools so that they can get additional layers of support. Um, but we do actively encourage parents and young people to let us know if things change, particularly if things get worse, which sometimes they do. And who wants to comment on how we assess the sort of you know, how effective our, our treat, the treatment is and, and people coming back in and all that sort of stuff. The very good point that Philip made about that. Um, thank you. So um, we have a range of uh, outcome measures. Uh, so the, the standard thing would be to have a range of outcome measures both filled in by the young person, the family, and ourselves at baseline and then at uh, regular intervals until uh, uh, another one at discharge. So we, uh, last month, um, we had pretty close to 100% completion of those, um, the completion, and we don't, uh, so it's not a national requirement to report on the changes between baseline and end. Um, that is coming, it's just been delayed, I think, because of COVID, but um, our, our own internal um, you know, measurements show that there is, uh, I think the last figures were about 60% showed, you know, mild or modest improvement. There, there will definitely be a cohort which improve really well, um, and then there'll be a cohort which, you know, don't, you know, improve, and then you have to reevaluate the, the treatment plan and suggest alternate therapy. This is, this is for straightforward therapies, um, having, you know, baselines for things like autism and, uh, um, you know, those kind of ongoing disorders is, is, is trickier. Thank you. Tony. Thank you. Uh, actually, Councillor Corfield, uh, Nick, one of my questions there, but... Uh, <laughs> sign sign of a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you a single point of assessment. Just out of interest, is it a call centre operation, or is it some you know you get through, straight to clinician? And also the about the, the number of 150 referrals a month. Are many repeat ones because 
people uh, if people are having episodes they tend to go back you know we, we as counsellors get people contact us and it's the same person quite often so you know there's 150 that's 150 new cases a month or is it repeat people's people having episodes etc good questions um so the single point of assessment is manned by clinicians um generally um it's nurses so they are all trained mental health practitioners and um they are able to do they're able to be curious about the presentation of the child or young person and gain as much information as possible to enable them to make a decision about what the next steps need to be. So um, that's, that's a, a, a very good service and, and one that we are very proud of. In relation to um, your second question, which was, sorry, remind me. About repeat. Repeat. People. People. So um, for Hillingdon Cams, um, very few of the young people that get referred in get rejected just based on a paper exercise. So quite for the vast majority, and I don't have the data in front of me, but for the vast majority they are seen and as a minimum have a robust triage. And at that point they may go on to have a further assessment, a more in-depth assessment that was mentioned um, by Dr Mohammed, or they may be um, triaged and signposted. Um, but I don't have the figures in terms of the numbers that are triaged and signposted on, how many then get re-referred back in. It would be great to get those numbers because that would be very interesting. Okay, I did say Tony had the last question, but then June put her hand up, and I can't turn June down, not this early in the evening anyway. So June has the last question. Just a quick one, thank you, from, from um, NWL. Um, you said mental health leads, there's leads in school. Um, one of our weakness sessions, um, they were under pressure because some schools do have to fund their own extra mental health leads because they don't have enough capacity to deal with the children that comes into um, that, that comes forward with um, issues of anxiety and signs of mental health. How many schools, if you, if, um, do you know how many schools that um, in the borough for Hill and Dan, how many of them has got that facilities available? Do you want me to? So, um, Hillingdon, we're, there are a number of ways in which that programme has been implemented, and we're now, I think we've got fully complemented the first of our first wave, and then we're through going through the second. I think we're currently at about 15 of our schools that currently have full-time access to that, but with the plan in place for the rest of those teams to come forward to work in all of our schools. A lot of schools will choose to provide additional support because I think they think it's a very good idea to have a well-being practitioner as part of their, their staff group. So a lot of them will, will have that post, or perhaps also have school nurses offering support in school, as well as having the mental health support team. So there probably is a different m map of what's available in schools at the moment. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'm going to bring this session to a close. Um, thank you so much to everyone who's come and attended the session and given previous evidence and provided information. It's been an absolutely fascinating uh, investigation that we've done, and we have the very intimidating task now going away and coming up with recommendations. Um, I'm sure what we'll do is we'll go back to you once we've sort of thought about recommendations and, and direction of travel, because we'd really like to test those with everyone here tonight. So you'll be hearing from us in, in the next couple of months. So I understand, Jane, that you are leaving this arena or our arena if that's correctly so um, thank you so much for the work you've done um, and and we might still ask you for your opinion even if you've left obviously if you're on a beach in Barbados and you don't respond to us then that's okay um, but um, anyway so fa thank you everyone for being so open and, and giving us lots of information and um, yeah we'll be in contact soon before we make our recommendations Okay, you, you can leave if you want to. Obviously, if you're interested in anything else that's here, you're welcome to stay as well. Um, so, now we're going to move on to Agenda Item 7, which is partially linked in some ways, isn't it? It can be linked anyway. Uh, the Family Hubs consultation. So, obviously, the Family Hubs is a, 
a wide big thing and I know Hayden's here who's chair of the Children, Family and Education Committee. I keep on, I, I normally lose one of them when I explain it. So who, who are scrutinising more broadly the whole sort of element of family hubs. Where we're really interested is, in is those health and social care services that will be built into the family hubs and how they will be delivered and ideally why it would be better they're coming from family hubs. So Claire, can you give us a bit of an explanation on that? Certainly. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so um, my brief report uh, provides hopefully an overview of the, the national context and picture for family hubs and then um, the local context um, and the consultation that the Council is currently undertaking um, over a 12-week period to um, look at the draft family hub strategy that we've developed and gain resident and partner feedback um, as to our proposals as to what family hubs will look like in Hillingdon. Um, family hubs are a national initiative um, and the government has committed that there should be family hubs in every region of England. Um, the idea of a family hub is to provide a central access point to families with children aged 0 to 19 and up to 25 years for those children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities. And we're really looking to provide a central place where families can go for information, advice or guidance um, around a range of issues or challenges, but particularly for family needs, relationship, health and other situations. Um, so there's, there's national support through the National Centre for Family Hubs, which is led by the Anna Freud Centre um, and funded by the DfE. Um, and then also um, there's additional sort of more localised support um, across uh, regional networks um, which exist where family hub leads are coming together to share ideas and information and, and support as they are rolling out uh, family hubs across their local authorities. Um, underpinning some of the research around family hubs is also the Best Start for Life report that was re uh, the review that was led by Dame Andrea Ledsom MP and that really looks at championing family hubs as the place where early access starts for children and families in their earliest years. Um, so one of the key themes of Family Hubs is to develop a Start for Life offer, which specifically lays out support for children and families um, for the earliest years. And that very much looks at maternity and health services um, alongside um, parenting support and reducing parental conflict. Um, so in Hillingdon, we have our first Family Hub. It's located here in the Civic Centre in the mezzanine level. Um, we opened in November 2021, uh, so we're kind of coming up towards our, our second um, anniversary of operation. Um, and really the, the purpose behind creating our first family hub um, was to provide a specific delivery space for five key council services. Um, so we have co-located Uxbridge Children's Centre, um, the supervised contact service for children who are looked after, um, the adolescent development services, the multi-agency psychology service, and also our youth justice service. So we've provided an operational base for all of those services together here in the, in the mezzanine level um, and we've called the space Uxbridge Family Hub. Um, but whilst it provides a, a key delivery space for those services, it also wraps around a whole range of um, services delivered by health partners and by community partners from the voluntary uh, um, sector services as well. Um, so we are looking at how we are supporting families to have local access to uh, health and um, social care activity as well as voluntary sector services um, and councils delivered services in their local community. And that's the ethos behind the strategy that we've written. Um, so obviously we have one hub in Uxbridge, we have another in development in Hayes, but we've looked at the borough as a whole, um, we've looked at the need across the borough in, in uh, the localities that we have, um, and we've developed a strategy uh, where we're proposing to deliver six family hubs, which are larger um, delivery points. Uh, where a, a, a greater range of services can come together um, and then a range of other smaller delivery points from existing um, uh, services that are already operational um, which we would look to evolve and change again to provide um, local access in local communities. Um, so that's kind of the ethos of, of, of what we're trying to do. Um, in terms of, of services, we have a range of partners that are working with us. So as I said, we start in the earliest years with maternity services, delivering antenatal and postnatal care. We also have perinatal mental health services working from the, from the hub, um, linked into the children's centres and um, health visitors as well, so providing a whole range of um, perinatal mental health needs in, uh, for um, parents in that first year following the birth of their child. Um, we have health visitors and the community nurse nurses working from the hub um, as well, so supporting delivery of the developmental checks for children at eight months old and at two and a half years, as well as the well baby services, so weighing and measuring um, children's height and weight um, and providing that kind of anecdotal support and advice for parents um, to allay fears or concerns or to provide additional support as they move on. 
Um, additional health services from our integrated therapy services are also linked into the hub. So we have uh, drop-in services from uh, both physio, um, occupational therapy and speech and language therapy on rotation across all of the children's centres and therefore they're also part of the hub offer where parents can drop in um, to a service and speak to a therapist to gain some informal advice and support. That may then go on to a formal referral um, for specific support. Um, and we, we do a lot of work in collaboration, particularly with the speech and language therapy service, um, to look at early communication for children um, in, and sort of supporting attention and listening skills um, and uh, communication and language as well. And so working alongside therapists, supporting the children's centre team to run groups and activities that, that really meet um, children's needs in that way. Um, some of the other things that um, are delivered from a, from a social care point of view, so um, our young people's team regularly meet the young people that they work with down in the family hub. Um, it's a, a, a much more um, encouraging and welcoming um, and joyful space to, to kind of engage with somebody. Um, similarly, um, the Adolescent Development Service run peer mentoring programs from the Family Hub. They do one-to-one -one counselling and support down there. We have a pool table, we have a, um, a mini football table, we've got a chill-out space. So it's, it's absolutely an ideal space for, uh, for counselling, for one-to-one -one mentoring um, as well. And so those op opportunities also happen um, down in the Family Hub. And the, the strategy lays out um, plans for how we can expand those links together um, for delivering services and making sure that we have those spaces where we can co-deliver services um, across the whole borough. I'll stop there because I could talk forever. So happy to take questions and clarify further. Great. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions before I open out to the rest of the committee. Uh, my first one is around... Um, in, in the report, there's, there's lots of talk about integrating with health services and looking at things holistically. And obviously, one place that people come to for lots of different things, and then from that, they can they can get the help they need or signposting the right signposting um, um, to the help they need. Um, can you talk a bit more about how that works, or how you know in in practice, or do you have any examples of how that's worked well since you've opened your first family hub? Because obviously, getting that right, I think, for me, sounds very crucial to making family hubs. Um, a really positive development. Um, certainly. So, um, an example would be um, the, the midwifery services that are delivered from the family hubs. Um, we also, um, as children's centres and um, health visiting, we deliver an antenatal programme of care and support called Your Bump and Beyond. So, health visitors can directly refer um, first time mums or mums that they have concerns about into the antenatal programme that's delivered. Um, in the fam uh, either in the family hub or, or more locally in the community. So that's one, one that we already have. Um, similarly, if um, a, a midwife is working with a family where there are concerns around um, preparation for birth and the support that a family uh, might need in terms of um, either confidence or um, understanding um, what um, a baby might need when they first arrive, they can refer into the Children's Centre Support Service. Um, so one of our family development workers would work alongside a parent to help them prepare for birth um, and similarly some of those referrals also come from children's services as well um, so we can provide that additional support and advice to, for preparation for, for parenthood um, and, and preparing for the way in which um, a, when a baby arrives. I think similarly when we're working with um, health visitors and they're delivering um, sort of uh, developmental reviews within the family hub um, they may well be talking to a parent where um, a child uh, needs support in a particular area of their development and so in order to do that they may refer them um, very quickly um, to a service that the children's centre team are offering or it may be that actually we need to do some more um, support and advice to enable them, the parent to come to terms with the fact that their child may need more support and so actually um, in a similar way we may pick up children who are attending say a stay in place session um, and therefore um, signpost and then to speak to the health visitor when the health visitor is in next. So actually we're kind of making those um, informal connections in that way without the need for a formal referral because people are physically co-located, we're able to put people in touch with others. So actually the, the health visitor can drop into the stay in place session um, as can the midwife if necessary or vice versa. We can say actually the midwife here if you want to wait and speak to her when she's got a space then um, she'll be free in 15 minutes. And so we can make some of those informal connections as well. Just a, a sub to that question. So essentially, if, if obviously issues are raised that maybe the family hub doesn't uh, isn't able to deal with, but there are other voluntary sector organisations who can, the family hub I assume is a place actually where that trusted relationship you have with families, you can go actually, you know, do you try over there or or get help over there? I assume is that partly how it should work as well? 
it's absolutely how it should work. So family hubs um, are about pulling together a network of services. Um, the, the vast array of services that exist in communities mean that we can't all be co-located or delivered from one delivery point. It's not physically possible. But absolutely part of the remit of a family hub network is to actually have a good understanding of the community they serve and the needs of that community, but also the resources and the support that exists locally in order to be able to support families. So um, similarly echoing what was said earlier about the no wrong front door, um, if a family arrives at the family hub and needs advice and support, but there isn't a service there that can support them either that day or, or in terms of our, our offer, it's about us ensuring that they know who it is to contact and nine times out of ten making that initial contact for them. So you know, if we can pick up the phone and make a connection, then we'll absolutely do that. Um, but obviously we've only got one hub at the moment, so that's something that we still need to replicate across the borough um, should the um, strategy be approved. So you very kindly sat through the previous agenda item. Um, is there a role for family hubs in terms of helping children's mental health? Um, any, any, any thoughts on what you've heard, what you heard previously, and, and how family hubs can sort of help achieve better outcomes? Um, I think there absolutely, absolutely is a role um, for how we can support. I think we have an opportunity to provide a venue um, if that's a venue that's, that's helpful. So, for example. Um, the Adolescent Development Service um, run one of the lower level um, support counselling programmes that supports young people with mental health needs. Um, the Family Hub would be a place that that may well be um, appropriate and accessible for them to, to, um, to be part of. I also think um, as much as it's about supporting young people, it's also about supporting their family as well, because the families are those that, that see their young person struggling um, and they need a level of support themselves. So I, I also think that, that we have a role to play in supporting families to be connected, whether that's you know being a space to host family groups um, and opportunities for families to connect together, as well as also linking them into the local network of Thrive opportunities that exist within the local community. So actually, if waiting well is one of the challenges that, that families are struggling with, if we can support in making those connections or providing a space for voluntary sector services that are delivering part of the work to come together, then absolutely we have a place to play in that. Great, right, I'll open up to the rest of the committee now. Uh, Philip, you had your hand up. I did, thank you. Um, uh, properly functioning families are of immense societal value uh, with uh, good outcomes all around. Uh, so I've got a couple of questions relating to this. So um, firstly, in relation to the funding aspects, and I see Hillingdon is not currently in receipt of funding uh, for this. I just wonder whether that perhaps presents an opportunity for us to shape services in a way that uh, perhaps bears our Hindu's image, if you like, uh, perhaps in a way we might not be able to do. That, that, that's my first question. And the second one is, I understand this is a universal service, although there are priority groups that we are uh, looking to support to a greater extent than others. I just wonder how, how we're striking a balance in targeting the activity that goes on within to derive maximum benefit and to achieve some of our health and social care policy objectives. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in terms of funding, um, no Hillingdon ha is not currently being funded by the Department for Education to um, develop family hubs. The funding that has currently been rolled out is for 75 local authorities, so approximately half of the local authorities across the country are in um, what I'm uh, hopingly calling phase one, um, assuming that there may be a second phase of funding coming. Um, however, w what that does mean is that whilst the DfE have developed, uh, sorry, developed a framework for family hubs, uh, we're not beholden to it because we're not being fun funded by them. So it gives us a framework upon which to develop um, our services and to think about how um, we, we're working in the same way as other local authorities. But from a time frame point of view and from a, um, a local delivery model point of view, um, we are currently free to develop that as Hillingdon needs and as Hillingdon sees fit, um, particularly in response to um, uh, the, the feedback that we receive from residents and partners through the consultation. That will help us to, to shape the service going forward. Um, in terms of targeted activity, the priority groups I refer to in the report are very specifically at the moment related to the children's centres um, because um, that's the way in which we currently manage our, our work. So we have a, a number of priority groups that we look to see how we can support those families. But um, specifically, the, the Family Hub offer is about striking the balance between universal, what we'd call the gatekeeping services, that 
um, bring families in and, and help them to feel welcome and supported um, and the family hub should be welcome and open to all um, but absolutely we, we do have a, um, a, a balance to strike in terms of the targeted support which needs to be in response to resident needs so some of that will be about local communities having different needs um, in terms of um, the, the situations and the challenges that they're presented with, which we know are different across our local authority, um, as well as also looking at the priorities that we have as a council in terms of our, um, our strategy and our plan going forward. So um, at the moment, we've, we've done a lot of work, particularly in the earlier years, um, around looking at supporting children with additional needs um, from an educational point of view, because we know that that's a huge pressure, particularly um, post-COVID as well. Um, so that's some of our targeted activity today. Thank you. Sizzle. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to pick up on this, um, the frameworks. Um, I like frameworks. <laughs> and just kind of wanted to know how, we, how in comparison or different or what, because you've got a national framework which the government have done through government funding, and then you've kind of developed your own framework, I assume, for, or is it associated with, is it comparable with, is it, how different is it, because I don't kind of get, I don't, you know, I don't know the two frameworks to kind of know what, what we're doing that's the same, what we're doing that's different, how, how it compares and what could be better or worse. So um, there's only one. There's one framework. I haven't developed our own. What we have done is to use the DFE framework to to overlay um, what we're doing in Hillingdon. But from a DFE point of view, there are, are three components to the framework. Um, and I always get them wrong. Um, so access, connection, and relationships are the three themes that um, exist through the DFE um, framework for family hubs. Um, I, what I would say is that um, in relation to the DFE framework, there are some very specific. Um, time frames that they would want you to work towards um, in terms of achieving things and we have some greater fluidity around how we might choose to do that. Um, similarly there are some expectations in terms of how we would set up advisory groups and boards um, to, to monitor and review and receive feedback around the work of family hubs and again um, we have greater flexibility about how we may choose to do that going forward um, at this point in time because we're not funded. But in terms of the ethos of access, connection and relationships it underpins the work that we're doing alongside um, the principles that um, actually were, were laid out by the Family Hub Network, um, who have been um, one of the uh, charitable groups that have sat around and alongside family hubs, for a mu family hubs for a much longer period of time um, and kind of predate the, the initial um, work by the DFE and the Anna Freud Centre. Rita, and then I've got June, and then I'm going to propose that we move on after June. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, coming back to something that Councillor Poonton mentioned earlier about, the, you know, we're a very diverse um, community in Hillingdon. So, how well is it received in certain communities as well? Are, are they using it as much as, you know, if we look at the demographics, if we look at the townfields, the most deprived wards in Hillingdon. So, if we look to the south and the north of the borough, do we have a quite a diverse collection of users or is it linked to only certain areas in the borough? So in terms of family hubs, we only have one at the moment and that's the, the one based here in Uxbridge and the next one will open in Hayes, um, hopefully July, August time. Um, so in terms of the, the, the wider service offer, I can't comment across the whole borough at this point in time. What I can say from my experience in delivering children's centres across the whole borough is that we have some parts of the borough where services are, are really well used and the universal offer um, is really sought. Um, and then we have definitely have other communities that we need to work much harder um, in terms of ensuring that they understand the services are available and the engagement. I think one of the, the real benefits from family hubs is that actually um, where we deliver the service from in terms of the physical building is not the important thing. The important thing is taking the service to communities. And whether that means that we're delivering that through the local church hall or at the Gurdwara um, or in the community centre down the road, um, we will have, um, if the, the consultation ag agrees it, um, a, a plan to have some um, sort of flagship hubs, if you like. But actually the service offer and the service deliverer needs to be mobile. Um, and needs to be flexible in each part of the borough in order to meet the community that they, they support. So um, we have experience of uh, working um, with, uh, the with, sorry, with the Adolescent Youth Service um, using their, um, the bus 
um, and going onto the Traveller site down in West Drayton because that's where the community is and we need to be flexible in order to actually meet communities in that way. June. Thank you, Claire. Um, on, on your presentation item 24, you've got a, the, the register of family, and within that you have some data of um, the amount of people that actually access, that have uh, visited the hub and attend the hub. And in it, you've got 40% of these families are from priority group. How many are there from the different priority groups that you mentioned here? We've got to break them. How many of that 40%? of people using it from the breakdown of the groups that you presented. Just bear with me, councillor. Um, so let me just see if I have that to hand. I don't have it as percentages, but I can tell you fam uh, numbers. So um, in terms of uh, um, the, the, and this is specifically around the families using the, um, the, the Uxbridge Family Hub from the Children's Centre group, so just particularly that hub, I do have wider data for the borough which I can share outside of the meeting if that would be helpful. Um, so um, in terms of um, across the whole um, of the attendees, so families, so um, actually no, this is, this is for, the, um, for the whole locality, I'm afraid, sorry, so it's for the whole of the South West which includes um, families from um, using the children's centres in Cowley as well as in West Drayton and Cherry Lane. Um, would you like that information or would you like me to um, uh, provide it? Yes, if you can share that information with us, please, because I'm just wanting to see what the figures are on it. Sure. So um, in terms of, so for families attending um, the whole of the South West uh, children's centres, of which there are six, um, there were, uh, in terms of the, the top five categories, so it was 3,889 families on low income, um, 2,344 families uh, with children in need of additional support, um, 2,069 families who were lone parents, um, 1,500 families uh, who were from workless households, and then 1,474 families who were new arrivals to the UK. The caveat I would say with for that is that some of those families will fit into more than one of those categories. So in terms of um, priority group, parents self-identify. It's not for us as professionals to put somebody in a priority group. When a family registers, and they tell us um, on their registration form whether they fit into any of our priority groups. So it means that we can ensure that we're tailoring the support that we provide and their access to services um, as expediently as we can. So um, it helps us to make sure that the services we deliver help to meet the needs of the families in that community. But as I say, it's slightly subjective because families self-identify, so some families may choose not to self-identify and that's their right to do so, but also some families will fall into more than one category because of their current circumstances. Thank you very much. And, and if there's more tailored data on that, if you could provide that to Nikki within the sort of next month and then she can disseminate that to us, that would be great. Um, thanks so much, Claire, for coming to speak to us, speaking to us about that. We'll, we'll watch with interest how family hubs develop. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we now move on to agenda item eight, um, which is a police and mental health attendance at A&E update. Um, for those who are fans of this committee and would have watched what we did last year, around this time last year, you'd have seen that we did have um, a big sort of evidence meeting on this and um, a lot of positive discussion about better ways of working or good ways of working together in order to improve the situation, such as the crisis care concordat. Um, so uh, in this meeting, it would be really useful to hear about how people have been working together over the last year since we had that meeting. And of course, second, we cannot ignore the um, police commissioner of the Met's announcement that um, police officers will no longer attend um, where mental health issues are reported unless it's life-threatening or, I suppose, a, an actual criminal event is happening. So. Um, the second part of what we'd like to hear about is the potential impact of that decision on Hillingdon. So, uh, we have Vanessa from CNWL and Sad from the Police. You're welcome to take it away in any form you wish. So, evening Chair, evening Councils and Honourable Colleagues. Um, I'm Sad Hussain, I'm a Detective Chief Inspector for the West Area Public Protection. Um, I have a number of portfolios under me, one of them is Mental Health. Um, I was um, honoured to be 
given a, a, an opportunity to come back here again. Uh, I was here last year um, uh, myself with, with several of my colleagues, and unfortunately they have to send their apologies today. Um, so in relation to uh, a couple of your questions, I'll start with the first one. Yes, we have been working very closely with the Integrated Care Board, and I'm thankful to both Jane and Richard because uh, we have been involved in a number more meetings than we were ever involved with before, and that no doubt has helped us be more collegiate in our relationship working more. Um, I'll just give you the context. Obviously, mental health, well, we're well aware, is still going up in terms of the referrals. Um, the changes, obviously, post-COVID, now the increase in terms of cost of living is no doubt causing uh, mental health in itself across society to go up. And I think we have to acknowledge that first, I think. That brings with it demand. And unfortunately, we don't have an endless pool of money, uh, nor do we have an endless pool of resources. So we have to understand how we can be more efficient in terms of that, but ensuring that the public get the best service and people who are in crisis also get the best service. So I don't want to bore everyone with data, but just sort of give you an idea. Um, the NPCC did a productivity review this year across policing nationally, and they said about a million hours of police hours were lost in the period between handover and any. Um, the Met has suggested uh, it's about 10,000 hours a month across policing as a whole, uh, with sort of handover times of being 14.2 hours on average in A&E uh, and for health-based places of safety being 8.5 hours. I would like to say in West Area we're better than the average which clearly shows that we're working better together. We're actually near sort of nine and ten hours um, if you look across the board. So we're actually working better than the av met average, uh, but still a little too much. Now, as a result of that, 20% um, of call William met wide is mental health related. In West Area alone, it's near 30%. And I say West Area, I'm talking about Hillingdon, Hounslow and Ealing. It's 30%. And the reason being is we in West Area have the highest level of Section 136s across the Pan London. That's probably why more of our call volume is around that. Now, there's, you know, there, I, there's a number of reasons, like I said, you know, we can talk about sort of the socio-economic challenges, but we also have a large number of uh, mental health trusts on here. We have two big mental health trusts. So we have CNWO and we have West London. So we've got to acknowledge that as, as such as well. Um, so just to sort of give you, a, a, again, a bit more context, at the moment what we're seeing is still too many people going into A&E. Um, and and, and I, I work closely with Vanessa, and, and this is not what we want, clearly. We do not want people going into A&E who are suffering from crisis. But at the moment, we still have too many. We still have a, a split with sort of two-thirds to one-third um, at the moment. Uh, now, there could be reasons for why they go any. One of them is obviously because they have medical challenges, so they need a medical clearance. Um, on our last study that we did, only 20% of them was in that category. So we still had 40% of people who shouldn't be going into a and &E. um, Police still transported. Originally, back in June 22, we started at about 60% of individuals that were suffering from Section 136. Police were transporting them to the hospital, whether it's HBOS or, 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 or A&E. That's now gone down to 45%. So there is a 15% drop. But still, officers are using police transport, which again is not the best transport to transport these vulnerable patients to A&E. So that's just a, a, a quick sort of, uh, again, like I said, it's, this is not about figures, this is about sort of context, just to provide a, a, a little more. Uh, so we have been working with uh, Vanessa's team in terms of trying to figure out what, where the pinch points are, where those barriers are, and like I said, I think you've got to look at it from 
right at the beginning of this journey, I think Helen did a piece of work in terms of a, a study looking at six different cases from basically the whole life journey of those cases. Um, and it, it actually starts right from the beginning, when that call comes in to police. Um, obviously, police officers at the moment are being deployed to all mental health-related calls. It's at that time when officers arrive, <coughs> officers make, should, and what should happen is officers should arrive, make a decision about whether this person is suffering from a mental health crisis or not, and at that point phone the SPA, which is a sim single point of access. The single point of access SPA should, and again, Vanessa will tell you probably better than I do, is staffed by mental health nurses, is it grade seven? Mm -hmm. Grade seven mental health nurses, who should then be able to say whether the individual should be sectioned or whether the individual has other alternatives. We know from the study that that's not been working well. Um, now, there's, again, there's two, two areas of concern here. One's about officers being slightly risk-averse, and the other one's about being the spa being risk-averse. So there's two points of, of failure there. And what have we done to try to address those? So in terms of the officers, there is now training being rolled out met-wide, and it's called alternative to section 136. That's what the training is called. And again, that's to train officers to think more than just section 136 of the patient. It, it's what are the other alternatives? Um, that I will come to in, in a minute in terms of what those alternatives look like and what we need to strengthen those alternatives to ensure that demand pipeline effectively for Section 136s is lessened. Um, and the other part is the SPA, again, needing additional training and strengthening of their decisions and, I suppose, assurance that they're making the right decision. Um, and again, I think those, those the, so that's, it starts right from the heart there because if people don't come into the section 136 pipeline, we don't have to worry about the rest of the journey. We don't have to worry about officers going there. We don't have to worry about waiting in the A&E. We don't have to wait, worry about it going to the health place base of safety. So we've got to stop it at that point. And like I said, there is training going on in terms of policing and, um, uh, and uh, I've just discussed it with Alistair outside this meeting and that we are looking into the SPA and, and how we can strengthen that sort of link between the SPA and the police. So that's just, a, again, to understand the journey and what, where, where some of the pinch points are. The second, or the third major pinch point, if you look after those two, is actually at the handover period. So with health-based place of safety, we actually get a really good service. We can go to health based place of safety, residence side. We generally get um, the, the, the handover time is generally much quicker, much quicker than it is in A and E. There's a really good relationship, um, and we can hand over. I would say a couple of hours at most. However, when you go to A and E, the officers are waiting there a long period of time, even after medical clearance has taken place. And it's, what is the pinch point there? So that is about working closer with our A&E colleagues because no doubt they have other really sick individuals coming into A&E. That is not the best place for these people. They have other demand, and we have to look at it from that point of view as well. So they can't just service us straight away, and that's not unexpected. However, I always say where police officers are then sitting with... Um, these really sick individuals, um, they're not addressing core police duties, they're not tackling crime, and they're not dealing with that sort of protecting life and property. That's what they're not doing. Um, so I think that that's the reasons why we've sort of tried to go back to the core police doctrine, and one of the reasons why right care, right person has come about. Um, I'll leave it at that before I start on the right care and right person and open that up to Vanessa and, and, and Richard, no doubt. Thanks, Sarge. Um, so I guess um, from a, um, so to introduce myself, sorry, I'm Vanessa Odlin. Um, I'm the Managing Director in Central and North West London and um, one of my, um, my jobs is to uh, look after Hillingdon Community Health and Mental Health Services, um, of which this discussion um, comes into. I guess the main point I want to make is 
our main responsibility is to look after the people and patients that we um, or that come under our remit um, in Hillingdon. And I guess um, to the point of um, to, to the point you made, Sarge, is, is that's something we want to do jointly. Um, and uh, to the point around the, the kind of point around spa and triage, um, we want to make sure that they also, have, you know, the nurses in triage feel that they can make the right decision. And, and if we need to do more training, then absolutely. It may well be that um, taking someone to a health-based place of safety is the right thing. Um, my second point um, that I wanted to make, particularly around that, is um, some time ago, um, A&Es um, were made a health-based place of safety, rightly or wrongly. I absolutely agree with Sarge that um, a, a, an individual, a person, before they become a patient, um, may not need to go to A&E um, if they're taken there um, as a health-based place of safety. We need to make sure that we have the appropriate places for them. Um, and I guess thirdly, I absolutely understand the need to free up police's time and um, it may not always be the right, the right thing for them to, to, um, to be spending lots of time with, with patients who need to be cared for um, by mental health professionals. Um, I would back up um, the, the kind of comment that Sarge made around um, the fact that our teams are working much better together. Um, I was also um, here last year, this time last year, um, and obviously we presented um, a lot of um, work that we had done, but also a lot of work that we wanted to do over the last 12 months in terms of jointly working together, both with the police, the local authority, London Ambulance Service, um, and the ICB. Um, and I'm really pleased to say that that's happening. There are joint liaison meetings happening, um, both at frontline and at senior level, as well as, well as the crisis care can cause that. And I'll, I'll ask Richard to talk more about that because um, he's he's the chair of that um, that that can cause that. Um, I'd also say that we do need to do more work on looking at um, why. Um, people and patients are taken to A&E, um, so we have committed to, we've already looked at the pathway, we've done as much as we can within the resources we have, but I think there's a deeper dive that we need to look, and look at, as well as bringing our local authority colleagues with us on that, because obviously they provide the, the AMP service, so the service where, where patients will, be, will have a mental health act assessment. Um, so we've absolutely committed to, to doing that deeper dive and seeing what more we can do with the, within the resources that we have. Um, we have also, I think I talked about um, trying to apply for money this time last year. Um, so sadly, we weren't um, given any money um, nationally for a mental health triage nurse, which we really wanted to sit within the police force. Um, but what we were given was money to create two more health-based places of safety within the mental health um, environment. So we're having an additional one opening in Hillingdon. Um, that will be due to be open in August this year. Um, so it's being built now, and it will be actually much better. Um, so we're actually relocating our other two health-based places of safety, which weren't, um, which I didn't feel, and we had feedback from service users that it wasn't a nice place to be in. So we're creating a whole new suite of health-based places of safety um, that will be much nicer for people to be in. Um, and the additional, the second one, will be open in Kensington and Chelsea, so that's within the central and northwest London patch. Um, I also wanted just again to touch on the, the comments um, and our conversations around um, the triage from SPA. Um, so our SPA do have um, trained mental health professionals. It is in very similar, so they actually sit with our CAMS, our CAMS SPA team. So they sit in the same building, they sit in the kind of same what you'd consider to be call centre. So they will receive a call from from the Met Police. And I think on top of if they need additional training. I think there's something about that relationship building with local, with local police and actually being able to take those kind of risk decisions together because I think faced with a phone call and not with the person in front of you um, sometimes can be, um, speaking as a, as a mental health nurse myself, um, can be difficult to make those decisions and of course you're going to go with safety first and as I come back to my first point, we want to make sure that we keep both patients and our residents safe um, if someone is maybe perhaps behaving in, in a bizarre way um, um, in our community. Um, I think that's probably it from me, and I will hand over to Richard. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm still reflecting, Chair, on your comments about the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, uh, and I'm naturally very impressed by his triage abilities if he's able uh, at one glance uh, to identify who has mental health needs 
Uh, ra- rather, rather childishly, I, I thought an alternative to 136 was not turning up. <laughs> that was rather childish of me. But we'll, we'll come on to the more details of that, obviously, after. Yeah. Um, but, but absolutely seriously, um, I mean, I, th- I think this committee has touched on a really important area. Um, you, your committee, uh, encouraged us, um, if not to work together, because I hope we were already working together, but you really encouraged us to focus on this issue um, and to bring together uh, the statutory agencies, the police, uh, the NHS, uh, social care, of course. Um, And uh, we have tried to do that, and I think both as Sarge and Vanessa um, have said, um, we've, we've really bent efforts to understand uh, what the data is telling us um, to try and do a little bit of myth busting because I think there were some myths floating around uh, both within health and and perhaps within within police data uh, and to really look at a common interpretation of what was what was happening so we could then build uh, proper plans on. Um, I'm only sorry that Hillington Hospitals uh, aren't able to be here this evening, but they have been involved in this dialogue with us. Uh, and, I, and I, I'm sure that they would agree uh, that collectively we've made uh, great progress in supporting them uh, as well as supporting the mental health service uh, and the police. Um, I, think, I think you'll be aware that adult mental health pressures uh, in Hillingdon, in North West London, Integrated Care Board, but also right across London, have been um, a very important focus of attention in recent months. Um, NHS England um, is actively engaged both nationally and at London level. Um, And I understand that the chief executives of both CNWL and West London uh, Healthcare um, have been in touch to say that they really want to understand more about this work and to give support. Um, And as you know, the CNWL chief executive is national lead for mental health services, and so her support and pressure uh, is is really important. I think that um, with your encouragement, Chair, uh, we, we want to carry on focusing on this work. We will continue uh, to run the uh, crisis care concordats overlapping with West London Trust when necessary. Um, and I think that there is a specific issue that Sarge was reminding us this afternoon that I don't believe we truly understand, certainly I don't understand, which is that the numbers of Section 136s appearing within Hillingdon um, and manifesting in Hillingdon are among the highest, Mm -hmm. certainly in dispatch and possibly also in London, if if I'm right, Sarge. Um, And I, I sort of bring up facile question about, well, is that because of Heathrow? Um, I, I don't think it is, I th- or I don't think it's the only reason. And so what is it, uh, part, obviously, from the active, diligent, and conscientious work of Sarge's colleagues on the road, um, what else is it about the Hillington environment, the accessibility, the availability of services that is making those numbers? Because I, I think we would all agree that, in a way, we would rather... Um, clients were within the net of uh, support services that can give them help, um, even if that means high numbers, rather than low numbers in touch with services and lots of unsupported uh, activity going on elsewhere. Uh, but I don't, I don't think we understand the true reasons for Hillingdon and as and when we be, uh, Hillingdon being so high, and as and when be, we begin to track that down, we would really like to bring that back to this committee and. Um, and explore um, other departments' support to it. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, but um, thank you again to Sarge and to Vanessa for the work that they've done. Great, thanks. I'll, I'll, ask, um, I'll ask one question before I open up to the committee members. And um, I mean, obviously, it, it's great to hear that the working together over the last year, you know, has really sort of stepped up and, and, and led to improvements and the fact that the numbers of section 136 are so high yet our average waiting time is lower than other parts of london suggests you know a very good way of working i'm glad others are looking at it um but i want to come on to obviously sir mark rowley's announcement because obviously that's massive and and um i sort of wish 
others were looking at this earlier, so he didn't feel like he needed to do the announcement, though I completely understand where he's coming from on that, because we understand this is a very imperfect situation. Um, for those who don't know, um, the police commissioner at the Metropolitan Police Service wrote to health and social care partners to advise them that after the 31st of August, uh, police officers would no longer be ordered to attend calls in relation to mental health incidents unless there was a, a threat to life. And obviously the 31st of August actually is coming up quite um, soon. So I've got two questions really, one for Sarge and one for uh, our health partners. For Sarge, how, does that, how will this work in practice? And for our health partners, what do you think the impact will be and how will you deal with the impact of that? Thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, I'll start by being very honest and saying I don't know the complete answer because this very much has been lifted from a model uh, that Humberside used called the right care, right person model. Um, and in that model, uh, the first thing they did was obviously get some legal advice which was given. Um, and I, I, again, I don't want to bore everyone with the, the, the legal advice, but it was, it was very clear from the legal advice that... Um, the sort of duty of care under common law um, to protect individuals from harm uh, is not just for the police, um, and we all know that. Uh, but it, what it also said was that uh, the police may owe a duty of care to protect persons from harm where police have assumed responsibility to care for them, or where police have created directly or indirectly the risk of harm, and this is just a lift from the legal advice itself. They put that down to two main duties under the Human Rights Act, um, and the two main duties cover uh, a real and immediate risk to the life of a person, which is under the European, European Convention of Human Rights, Article 2, and the second point was a real and immediate risk of that person being subject to serious harm or other inhumane treatment, and that's under Article 3 of the Euro European Convention of Human Rights Act. Uh, so, and and, and the, the last part of that is, is that it says that the risks of harm where a duty will arise on the police will generally, but are not always, be from criminal acts of a third party. And, and, and this was advice from, from solicitors. So they've taken the, sort of the legal summary um, thought about what the police doctrine says, and the police doctrine is very clear. The three roles of police are preventing and detecting crime, maintaining and keeping the king's peace, and protecting life and property. Those are the three main police doctrines as per set out by the Home Office. Um, so the interpretation, and I use the word interpretation because I have no, not a legal mind in that sense, apart from being policing, was that we would respond to calls um, in, in a way that that legal advice could be interpreted. And that's why I don't have the details, sorry, if you are. <coughs> However, what that meant was when the call to service came in, so for instance when the 999 or the 101 call came in, the call taker would pro complete an assessment and there would be three options for the call taker and this is how right care right person is going to act. The first option is a police response is required uh, and the police will take on responsibility with dealing with that call. This would be logged, um, systems will be checked and, and staff will be deployed. The, sex the second option to call takers would be police may be required to attend, possibly with partners a system check and supervisor decision will be taken. Um, this will include system checks and consultation with other agencies to assess which partner has the right skills and experience to respond. And they've put this under inverted commas, a maybe response. And the third response is not a police matter, no checks required, this request does not fall within the core roles of policing and no Article 2 or 3 Human Rights Act exists. So that's how the actual call to service is going to work. That's what the right call, right person um, is going to be. So now clearly there is a need for a lot of training for the call takers to make that decision. 
but that decision will be based using the legal advice I've just stated today. Now that was a model that Humberside implemented. Uh, they were successful in implementing it. Their deployment to mental health calls went down from 78% to 31%. Um, there was, it says 508 fewer police deployments, but if you think that um, Humberside is probably the size of the whole of West area, probably just slightly bigger, um, and 32,828 officer hours were saved effectively in a year where tackling crime could be dealt with. Um, that was the outcome. So what does it mean for London? And that's what we're going to try to interpret. What that legal advice and how that training can be set about for London. The first meeting between chief executives, um, uh, I believe, and all NHS England and the major trusts is on the 7th of July. I um, mean, it's at that point I can be more clearer in terms of what the protocols are. But my understanding was for, in, in Humberside, the most important thing was obviously working closely with the local authority, with our colleagues in the NHS and, and, and in the local trusts, um, and setting up a memorandum of understanding. Um, again, like I said, I think we're at the start of this journey, and I can only tell you what it looked like in Humberside. I can't tell you what it looks like in the Met until that first uh, meeting is held, and hopefully we get clearer interpretation of what those protocols will be. Hopefully that gives you a bit of a taste, Chair. That was very that was very interesting. Thank you. I, I always enjoy a, a legal opinion. So, which it, but um, I, I, that was an interesting um, explanation of why this was happening. Uh, and also, to be honest, I didn't realise this had been tried elsewhere. And the fact it's been tried elsewhere and there is a model of it, even though obviously I've never been to Humberside, but I, I assume it's very different to London in many ways, um, is, is, is a useful starting point. Obviously, as more becomes known, if, if you could let Nikki know once things can be released, let us know, because we are very interested, obviously, in, in how this will develop. Yeah, and, and, and like I said, uh, once I have clearer ideas of what the protocols for implementation mean for right here, right person, I no doubt will come back and, and explain it, and hopefully by that time it may already be implemented. I know there is a worry across the trusts. It is not going to be a full stop where we are not going to at all at any time not respond to mental health calls because I've just stated that there are going to be three options for call takers. So it's not going to be a straight no. What I think has happened, and this is my own opinion, and I'll put it on record, is that I think there has been a media narrative which has unfortunately sharpened the focus for individuals who probably wanted, to be, wanted this point to be highlighted negatively. That's my own personal opinion. Um, however, I think that's how it's been read into. I think we are at a very early stage. Um, will it mean additional demand for the LAS? The answer is yes. And I think this is, we have to be very honest, uh, considering we have already tried to s reduce the amount of deployment from police vehicles, but this will add an additional stress to the LAS in terms of that. What I will say, and I was thinking about this as, as I was um, coming up here today, there are mental health cars. I think there was one in Wembley, and it may be an idea for both LAS and, and NHS to think a bit more widely on, on how those can be utilised. I've never seen one in our borough, by the way, but I know that it's deployed from Wembley. Um, so maybe better utilisation of those vehicles differently, um, and maybe more of those will be required. Uh, that's just my own view. I will say, and, and, and I've been talking for more than sort of five minutes, that's generally my limit, uh, but we are also trialling another project, which is called the Central Vulnerability Hub. And what the Central, Central Vulnerability Hub is, and we've already, tried, we've already piloted this for 48 hours on West Area. And what this is, is effectively uh, a group of individuals who, when the call does come in, and um, say we are saying that police should be deployed to it, police will then call these, these I would call them subject matter experts from the police, from mental health, who will then guide them on whether this individual needs to go to the HBOS or whether there are alternative options. So whether they need to go through the Section 136 pathway or there are alternative options. 
Now that will also be dependent on whether we can strengthen those alternative options um, and how well we can signpost them. Uh, that's the only thing I'll say. But thank you, Chair, for giving me the opportunity. No, I mean, this, this is a very important subject that people are concerned about, so you're very welcome to speak for over five minutes on it, of it definitely. Um, Vanessa Richard, from a health provider's point of view, I mean, what is, what is your thinking about how this might impact you guys and, and what you might do about it? So I'll, I'll start. Um, actually, I just wanted to talk a bit about the right care, um, right person model, because we have talked about that um, within our meetings with the, with the um, Met Police and with Sarge prior to that letter coming out, so we were very aware of the Humberside model. I think there's just a few points to note in terms of that model. Um, it works because they, there was partnership working, as you said, so absolutely um, we need to make sure that we replicate that. It also took them a number of years um, to implement the model. It didn't just happen overnight, so I think those kind of two points are really kind of important for us to, to kind of learn from. Um, in terms of implementing it. And I guess thirdly, from my perspective, we're absolutely committed from a central and northwest London um, position to um, both engage and work in partnership with organisations in Hillingdon to roll out a similar model. Um, in terms of impact, and you're quite right, so when, when the kind of letter hit, when, when it was in the media, um, in terms of impact, it was the first thing that we wanted to kind of have a look at in terms of impact. I think, if I can just say, we're, much, we're in a different place today than where we were when we first thought about impact. So um, having had conversations with Sarge about actually how we're going to think about partnership working and doing something that isn't dangerous and isn't unsafe for people, um, that is where we are now. But originally when we looked at the impact, so if it stopped tomorrow, if, if all support stopped tomorrow, actually I think the impact would be that there'd be less one three sixes. But actually that's because people would be left potentially. Um, and not picked up on a 136, so the preventative work that you try and do by having people placed on a 136 and bringing them to a place of safety um, to have them assessed, actually that would be being dealt with potentially by GPs, potentially by, I guess, local, whether it's the local authority, they might be in, on the streets, they, so I think, there would be mu I think that, that the risk would be um, that we would be preventing um, things um, much more. So I think that's certainly kind of where we came from. We're in a much, you know, different place now. And, and, um, and as I said, we're absolutely committed to working in partnership, to thinking about how we do something together to make sure we free up police's time, make sure people are in the right place at the right time and, and um, looked after and cared for. Richard, do you have any comments? I mean, I think just to, just to add to what uh, Vanessa and Sarge have been saying, I mean, you've, you've given us the first item for the next meeting of the Crisis Care Concordat, uh, where we're obviously bringing LAS uh, around the table with us. Um, I, th I think, I mean, I think what Vanessa's said is absolutely important, but, but the flip side of the um, Metropolitan announcement or the Humberside work was obviously the alternatives that had been put in place in Humberside to prepare for this. Um, and I think it is um, overdue, really, for us in North West London and in Hillington to be looking at what appropriate alternatives, whether that's street triage or others. Um, Riverside, as one of the predecessors of CNWL, were looking at um, street triage uh, in Westminster, um, and, and there are models uh, maybe for us to look at that are appropriate for Hillington. Um, but I think I, I, I think all public services need to get together to see how to make this work. Um, as Sarge has diplomatically said, um, there are issues around uh, potential risks uh, to the client themselves and to others. Uh, there's obviously a potential public order risk um, that will simply result in a 9-9 call being made for another reason. Um, so clearly we need, we need to look at how to make this work um, for the individuals concerned and and for the agencies, and uh, maybe we should we should be looking to an appropriate date um, after the seventh of Ju July when we can come back and uh, inform you of our, of our initial proposals. That reminds me actually at, at our meeting a year ago, um, it was agreed that I and the Labour lead might be able to come to crisis care con that meeting. That was June at the time and now it's used it's all. So I mean that sounds like a particularly interesting one to attend. So if, if it's okay, if there's nothing secret that you guys are discussing, um, if, if we could let us know the date, that would be really good. 
but let's make those arrangements uh, yeah. outside this meeting. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. By, by the way, Sarge, I know you said you'd have to leave around 8.30, so do feel free if we hopefully wouldn't have too many questions, but if you have to leave, we do understand, so don't worry about that. I'm happy to take Okay, great. Um, Sigil. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I just... I just wanted to say well done on all the partnership working first of all that you have done because I remember when I first started as a councillor and came as a sub into one of these meetings this was being discussed and that was being put there so I just think we've moved almost mountains to get to where you have got to um, at this point. I do also want to say that personally I felt very uncomfortable with police being called out to these and using this, their police time in this because it's almost criminalising mental health and that I feel very uncomfortable with. Um, but I understand how this has got to that stage. Um, I also feel very uncomfortable that it's A&E that gets the pressure because, again, it's not the right place as well. I'm very interested in more of these health-based hubs because I think that, it, that I remember that being a real good place to start from and I think more of this funding to get health-based hubs is important um, and also mental health cards I think we've talked about that last year almost that there was this and this is something that could be used more and whether there are more practitioners um, that are when you talk about street triage I think this has come up before as well and it's not a question, but it's just out there that actually this is an opportunity to do things differently rather than kind of using the police or A&E as our go-to points all the time, which take them away from life or death in A&E or crime on our streets in terms of the police. Um, I know it's not going to be a quick fix very quickly, but I think patience and partnership working and trial and error is going to be how we get through this. Um, so that's what I want you to say on that, really. Thank you. I think you've got lo lots of nods. So, uh, Rita. Thank you, Chair. I think um, Councillor Pring just echoed it and you've sort of answered my question between you collaboratively. First of all, again, I want to say thank you for working so well collaboratively and taking on board some of our feedback we've given you. My concern is that this RCRP, how is it going to be different from SPA? which wasn't working in the first place. Um, is it going to be primarily based on the three core questions? And I know DCI is saying you can't answer a lot of this because you've got to wait for this meeting. But those are just some of my concerns on how that's going to be any different. So I'll eagerly wait your feedback after the 7th of July, unless you have something else to add now. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, I suppose the main difference between the RCRP and the current um, journey is the fact that the RCIP will be at very much that call, at that point of service, at that call to service. So it won't even get to the level of SPA. We won't even go towards SPA. And the, the, the decisions there will not necessarily be about whether we are going to um, section someone like we would in the SPA. The decision will be whether we are actually going to attend that mental health call. That would be the main difference. I think what's what's interesting, bringing together what Cicel and Rita have both said, is what is the outcome for those who need help and support? Because I completely agree that A&E or police cells or whatever, not a great place for somebody having a mental health crisis, but at the same time, yeah, uh, you know, and I, I completely understand why the police have taken the decision to try and move this way, because ultimately police are being criticised for not attending enough crimes when you know other things are coming to place but what will be very interesting in this, in this new way of working if we understand really what those outcomes are for people. Jane you've got your hand up. I just wanted to, to go back a bit just to say that I've been attend I do attend the North West London Crisis Concordat where obviously this item is being discussed and looking at the work we've done locally. One of the things I think they fed back was that the audit that we did last year which I think came out of one of the recommendations here has been um, taken on board I think by that meeting and actually being promoted as a really good way of developing the partnership working across the ambulance service, the trust, the local authority and the, and the Met and I think that myth busting exercise that we felt did was, was really something we need, we need to, um, to build on. 
there, there are a number of conversations happening across sort of northwest London and indeed the London level about this, which is, and I think you mentioned the meeting on the 5th of July, so I think a lot of the work going on in the background to inform those conversations, but acknowledging the time it might take to implement and introduce those things. And just to add, when we, we've been focusing on our crisis pathway in Hillingdon, and I think you know, when I've heard mentioned before, we have introduced sort of open access to the cafe. We have opened the, retre the retreat, and I think street, street triage was on our list. Well, I think, it, it, well, I think one of the things reflecting on that is the time that it takes in our system for people to fully understand and feel confident and trust those options. And again, if you are on the end of the phone and you haven't seen what they look like, what they can offer, there's more, I think, to be done to help people understand when they're the right place and when they're not. So uh, uh, it doesn't happen. I, I think it just does take that time to build in both any changes like that. And, and that point is a theme across all three items we've discussed so far, isn't it, really? So, very good. Philip. Thank you. Um, yeah, very important change. Uh, critical that, that we get it right, and I'm delighted with all the engagement that's going on to do that as best we can. Um, I'm very aware that the intervention threshold under mental health legislation is very high anyway, so you know uh, there are some challenges there. My question is around health-based places of safety because not so very long ago it was mooted, I think, by uh, a pan-London health body that we could do with fewer of those. Uh, can we take from what's being said this evening that we, uh, we, we're not heading in that direction now because that would presumably cause all kinds of issues with what we're talking about? Yeah, no, I, I, I'd, I'd agree. We need, we need more, not less, um, health-based places of safety, hence why, as an organisation, we've taken the decision to increase by two. Um, if there were more funding available, um, obviously we'd want to make sure that we had um, the most appropriate number. And I come back to the point that we made last year, um, that actually a health-based place of safety or a, or a hospital health-based place of safety, a mental health hospital place, health-based place of safety, can actually be used by any police force. So, for example, Thames Valley, which is close to Hillingdon, um, may well go over the border and use um, the Hillingdon health-based place of safety, and we're not able to turn people away, and they also would use our spa to find out about availability and access. Um, so, I just yeah, that's the other, the kind of other area of challenge that we have um, Within, you, within the kind of use of our, our health-based place of safety. Great. Okay, well, I'm going to draw this item to a close. Obviously, there'll be more in the future due to what's going on, but thank you so much for coming to give us an update, and, and obviously, generally, within difficult circumstances, it sounds quite positive, so thank you. Right, so we move on to our next item, which is Agenda Item 9, which is an update on the Older People's Plan, and we have Kevin... Byrne, who's Head of Health and Strategic Partnerships, and he is on the television. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> please, please, uh, you, you are now on. You're now live. It feels like you're going to be you. giving us... Good evening, points. everybody. It sounds, it sounds um, like you're going to be judging Eurovision points for us, but no. Okay. Um, <laughs> the results, results from the, uh, yes, the North of England jury or something. No, not at all. Um, to, and thank you, firstly, for agreeing to let me um, to, to, to come to you tonight online rather than it's, it's helped me tremendously with some of my um, domestic commitments but um, so yes you have the older people's plan in front of you um, this is I think at the committee's request that we should um, um, get upstream of the, the report that's due to go to cabinet that report is now due for September it was initially July which is why it's on your agenda today um, this is an annual report that we take um, to update on the activities in the older people's plan some of the key things that have happened since last year which is worth me reporting on is that we have launched the council's strategy 2022 to 2026 that came in at the end of last year and of course what, what that's enabled us to do is to um, look again at the commitments we have in other plans under that wider, more strategic direction that we have from the Council strategy. So what I've done, and it's reported in the paper, is to take the, um, the seven commitments that are in the, uh, the, the, the new strategy and try and align underneath that some of the activities that are taking place across the Council. So I think this is a slightly fuller report. It includes a lot of the activities that we might regard as being mainstreamed in service areas. Um, and I've looked at 
at what we had in the former plan against that. Some things have closed. It's worth me mentioning that. We no longer run the older people's free burglar alarm scheme. Um, and we've, we've now um, completed the program of smaller grants to voluntary groups that we were running for a number of years. Those, those projects have now um, ended. So what we have here, I, I, I can go through the seven commitments if you'd like me to. Um, perhaps if I just do one or two, you can see the sort of the tone of where we're going and if you have any comments from it. Just, Kevin, yeah, just do one or two. Assume we've all read the paper, which I, I thought was very good. Fine. Very yeah, good. sure. Okay. But I, I, so, so just to start from the beginning, the, the first one about work to keep residents safe from harm. I've listed in there the work that we're doing with training standards, with the new localities and antisocial behaviour team, um, work with our stronger communities team in tackling community tensions, the hate cry out standards scheme, neighbourhood watch, our schemes, how these are promoted through the council with partners, use of CCTV, etc. And there's a fuller, the second item, which is, it's, it's got a lot of activity in it, as you might imagine, is more to do with um, enabling vulnerable people and older people to live healthy, active and independent lives. So there we have our physical activities program, the work we do through our contractor, better in our leisure centres, free swimming, etc. And, and the dementia cafes, uh, we've got the magic tables, the toga tafels in libraries that are supporting the dementia program, work on falls prevention. And, and it goes on. So I can, and th th this this report may uh, be updated between now and its report to cabinet because I'm trying to capture data on our ch achievements against all of these tasks. But you, I hopefully can see the the, the, the flavour of and the breadth of what is there. Um, and and that's basically the report that will go to cabinet to update them on all the activities that we're offering across across services with partners uh, to support older people in the borough. Uh, no, thank you. I thought it was a very good and interesting report. Um, I, I, have, I have one question really which is about how we shape our offer and how we prioritise. Of course in one sense we've got what people want, of course that's very important and obviously what we can do, um, but, but in the health sphere we've got other partners, I mean we've got the Health and Wellbeing Board, we've got the um, ICB, we've got the NHS who will, you know, they will pick up issues within certain parts of our population about, you know, problems that are happening, loneliness or um, you know, or whatever, whatever it is. I mean, do we get feedback from from these groups because they can often see potentially serious issues coming into our population at an early stage when when we shape our offer. I, I would point point to the the parallel strategy, which is the joint health and wellbeing strategy, which goes to the health and wellbeing board. Um, that that contains more depth on issues such as those I've reported in under the. I'd say this, uh, the fourth um, commitment, which is about working with the NHS, and where we talk about some of the neighbourhood working, the model of care, that sort of thing, which I imagine your committee has discussed in, in previous um, conversations. So that that what what this report really does is take from each of those the particular aspects that are related to older people and reports them back to cabinet once a year. So it's very much a report, um, and the I, we. We probably leave the, the the needs assessment, the consultation with residents, the, the business planning to the service areas that pick up from the overarching strategy, the delivery of their particular priorities. That, that makes sense. Um, okay, does anybody else have any questions on the older people's report? No? Okay, fantastic. So thank you very much, Kevin, and um, you, you now may switch off your television. <laughs> Okay, as I say, if, if, if you do have any particular comments, then do feed them in to me. There is chance for us to adapt the, the report if, if need be, um, if, you know, if you've got strong views one way or another, um, and it will go to Cabinet in September. That's the plan at the moment. Thank, thank you, and we will, we will keep an eye on it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your time. Good night. Right, okay, so we move on to Agenda Item 10, which is the Cabinet Forward Plan. Um, where? So I, I picked up three things that potentially could be of interest to us, and 
these are probably things I've picked up before because I always do this. I always say, oh, we're going to look at this. Should we should look at this. And Nikki says, oh, yes, you decided that at last meeting. But anyway, as, I, as my memory at this time of night especially has uh, it falls apart, I will still go through them. So um, in October, we have the um, Better Care Funding Section 75 agreement, and we have the annual report of adult and child safeguarding arrangements, two things that I think we could be interested in. I mean, Nikki, do you have a... Do you have a view on on if they, these two things are, are things that are good place, good things for our committee to look at? So the um, adult and child safeguarding arrangements, did you say? Yes. Sorry, yes, so that's, that is something that. Thursday, the um, 12th of, uh, of October. Yep. So um, officers have already contacted me about the possibility of including that on the agenda. Okay. Um, and the Better Care Fund Section 75 agreement, I'm more than happy to speak to um, officers and. Um, make sure that it's okay to actually get that yeah. on the agenda before it goes to cabinet. I think that is something that could, is of interest to us. And the other thing that I had noted down was on Thursday the 14th of December, uh, which is on page three, is the care support services. Again, that feels like to me something that um, we might be interested in. So obviously nearer the time maybe having a word with officers about if it's something that we could see beforehand that would be useful. Does anybody else have pick up anything else in the cabinet forward plan that they think is interesting? Don't feel like you have to find anything. The mental health. I don't think I saw anything on that. Obviously, there's nothing on that, I think, in the near future. So at our next meeting, if something comes up on that or if you, if you, if it's something else that's on here, that, then, June, you can definitely pick that up. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. So, should we move on to our last item, which is the work plan, which normally is not a very interesting item, but today is a very interesting item, because of the by-election on the 20th of July. And I congratulate everybody in this meeting so far for not mentioning the by-election. Well done. We all deserve uh, a, a biscuit when we get home for for being disciplined and concentrating on our subject, which is really good. Um, but unfortunately for us the by-election is actually happening on the same day as our meeting was meant to happen. I can't believe the Conservative Party chief whip in the House of Commons didn't call me to check, but never mind. Um, but that means, unfortunately, that our meeting cannot go ahead on Thursday, the 20th of July. So I've discussed three possible options with Nikki, and we can explore them further. But I'll, I'll give a quick pricey of, of the feedback I got from Nikki on those three different options. Um, the first one is, can we find another time in July? Essentially, we've looked at diaries and availability and also the ability of democratic services to do it, and the answer seems to be no, partly because the week after is, is absolutely jam-packed, including having meetings um, which other members are attending. The one day we thought we could do, we realised that it was major planning, and both Philip and Adam are on major planning, so it wouldn't mean fair, I don't think, to organise the meeting. So that's the first one. Um, the second one we thought about going for the 16th of August, um, but it issues slightly has arisen is obviously with holidays and all this sort of stuff are we going to have enough officers to come and give us reports and all this sort of stuff um, from a, our personal point of view can we all make it as well so that's an option that we could explore despite um, that those issues and another option is that we push most of it into September um, and then we have the um, health care updates which essentially takes a whole meeting in October uh, and then we pencil in a meeting in December in case we come up with big problems and we need another meeting because at the moment we've got no meetings in December. So those are the three options. Um, I'm open to all of them. I mean, the first one obviously sounds very tricky, but um, does anybody have any views on those three options? Can you put your mic on, sorry, Jean, just in case? I think August being a month of holidays and, and people book up a lot, I think that will be an impossible month in September. We probably will have to fit it in, but so when, where, and how? 
So what I was thinking, so I was actually looking at the work plan, and actually, funny enough, our future work plan is actually not very busy at the moment, which is amazing considering all our meetings last over two and a half hours long, which is longer than any other select committee. So, well, thank you, Hina, for subbing, and thank you for sitting for deciding to become and the uh, Labour lead on this. Um, so that can't um, be the case. But am I right in thinking, Nikki, that the agenda items that we had for July, if we did push them into September, they still would be relevant and still would be worth us discussing? Because that sometimes is an issue, isn't it, as well? Yeah, Chairman, what I can do is I think the majority of them will be absolutely fine, um, but I will need to double-check on the autism strategy consultation. Um, but I, I can check with the relevant officers about which reports are still going to be relevant by the time we get to September, and we can, well, we can, we can adjust accordingly. Okay. Can I just, yeah. um, and also, when we kind of put a lot of stuff into one meeting, the idea of being able to really ask questions or to look at stuff, so just, we just need to be mindful of that, I think. Me. Definitely. Because officers do a lot of work in putting these reports together, so it's you know unfair to rush them through, I think. No, no, definitely. Yeah. Rita? Thank you, Chair. We, we could dagger all the work out through three months, couldn't we? We don't have to do it all in September, do we? Well, yes. And that, I mean, that's another thing that we could discuss, me and Nikki, because obviously if there is a time critical deadline, for example, if a matter is going to Cabinet and, and we should be feeding in for them, then yes. But if not, then we could push things across and we could stagger that. I mean, I, I, I do feel that we should push things to, to those three months and I think we should pencil in a, a meeting for December because if we get stacked up, and as you say, completely, we want to give everything the attention it deserves. Because you know we always have packed meetings, and to be honest, I, I do try and cut them down. But actually, everything we discuss is seems to be is important and interesting. Uh, maybe biased. So, um, so if we pencil in the meeting in December, which means we can then have that space in order to do that. How would you like to do that? Would Would you like to? Can we look for dates now? Has, has everyone got their diaries, or do you think would you like to do it over email? Nikki? It's It's entirely up to to the committee. If you'd like to do it now, if you have your diaries available and have your availability for December, I have a um, a copy of the work program. Not the work program. The um, program of meetings. Sorry. Um, so be able to see if there are any clashes with any other committee meetings. Also, actually, do you know what? It will probably be easier to do this outside of the meeting okay. because there's going to be a lot of chewing and throwing. I think. Okay. So. so, so I think ideally we're meeting on 21st of November. So maybe ideally the second week of December we we should try and aim for. Before the schools close and also before Christmas party yeah. season kicks yeah. in, um, so <laughs> and and all those other commitments happen. So maybe if we can think about the second week of December, ideally. Okay. So if I contact members outside of the committee, that yes. way we also contact um, Councillor Bennett as well yep, and include him on it. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll look at availability of um, the nights where members aren't already on other meetings. Yeah, thank you. That'd and I'll, I'll circulate some possible Thank you. Um, and also, I have I have actually one sort of suggestion. I I think it'd be really useful to have a, a, an informal sort of meeting at some point, maybe in August, um, for those who want to attend to really discuss what we're going to say in our report because obviously we've had our evidence sessions and, and we've thought about a lot of things and a lot of themes have come out and certainly me and Nikki are going to go away and have a big brainstorm about it and obviously we would like to get the input of others as well um, because we, I think we probably need about an hour where we just talk about this stuff maybe behind closed doors if, if uh, depending on yeah we could do it, even do it virtually just because obviously the more minds that we put to this so um, could we think about maybe putting a date, if we can, during, you know, during August? I would suggest when we could do virtually online, depending on early August would be good. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I'm, I'm away then. Oh, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> but the internet. Well, exactly. We'll figure it out. The internet connection might. To be honest, I am away, but the internet connection will be fine. I think. So we, we were saying the 16th of August anyway, weren't we? Yeah. So do you want to just do that one? I mean, is, is the 16th of August okay for people? Just. <laughs> is that? You can. Brilliant. So, should we have? Um, what's a good start time? What's a good time for an hour in people's lives? What do people prefer? Yeah. 
Seven? Okay. In the morning. No. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 no. Do you know, uh, Lyndon Johnson, obviously the ex-president of the United States, he hated uh, Robert Kennedy. But he inherited Robert Ken Kennedy as his attorney Robert. general um, <laughs> when, when, obviously, he became president and, and Robert Kennedy's brother died. But he knew Robert Kennedy hated mourning, so he, he organised every single meeting with Robert Kennedy at 6 or 7 a.m. <laughs> so he could walk all over him. Um, so yeah, if you want to walk all over me, order, do 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 a seven a.m. meeting. But no, should we go for seven p.m. For online an hour? Online. And really, the idea is just to kick around ideas about what we should recommend and and, and how the report should be put together. Yeah. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what? I'm happy face to face. Chairman, I have already booked. Oh, this, this committee room, just in case. Have I ever said you're amazing? You can admit <laughs> it that you are amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, do you know what? I prefer face to face as well for those. If if we can do that, cause yeah. It, yeah. And could, we can have a flip chart. I love a flip chart. Yeah. Coffee. Um, excellent. So 7 p.m. here. It's it's technically an informal meeting, yeah. but but I think it'd be a really good idea to kick around ideas. Obviously, very open-minded to discussing stuff before then as well as they pop up because this is such a big subject that we need to give it some proper consideration. And also, if we can have the briefing of some of those um, Chairman, we had we had the one meeting where um, all members were present, and I think I've already passed on the notes from that. Um, the second meeting that we had, I haven't yet had clearance from the parent. I have spoken to her a couple of times to ask her if she's happy with the notes, but she wanted to make some changes. So, um, but I will circulate because some of the members wouldn't have been here for that first session. So I'll circulate those um, as soon as I get as soon as I get the other ones. No, no, I think the information that we've collected so far to have available for that meeting is, is a really good idea. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Okay, so I think that's sorry, it. Sorry. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Can I make um, one other yes. suggestion? We were, um, a, a visit to the Family Hub would be really, as a, as a committee, I just wonder if that would be, yeah, yeah. 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 I'd love to kind of, yeah, yeah, if we could do it as a committee, I wonder. Thank you. Yeah. I noticed this year in the um, committee sort of summary in the year they had pictures of visits. So when we go into the police concord that meeting, so we have to take a picture, a yeah. selfie of it, so we can stick it in in the back of that. So, oh, I've got one last thing to mention actually. So um, some of you might be aware that there is um, a joint Northwest London scrutiny health health and uh, health and social care scrutiny committee, which we obviously sit on because we're part of Northwest London. I'll give you my views on the committee outside this meeting, but um, I'll, the next one we are hosting, so it's going to be in Hillingdon, um, and it is some point in July. It's in my diary, so I'll definitely be there. Um, So it's on the 18th of July. So if anybody's free and interested in coming along to what watch, um, it, it basically starts at 10. It goes from 10 to 12. It'll be here in the Civic Centre. Um, essentially, it's all the Northwest London councils. We come together, and um, it's chaired by this guy from Brent. And um, we could obviously, as we know, things are moving towards a Northwest London basis. Mm -hmm. So we sort of hold them to account uh, on a Northwest London level. So as the next one's in Hillingdon, if you're free and interested. I'm that day also, okay. Well, it, I think is it recorded? <laughs> so yeah, so yeah. Um, so there you go. Later on in the evening when he, you can watch it. But um, yeah. So please, please come along. I, I, we will have coffee and biscuits, won't we? Fantastic. Okay. All right. I think that's everything, isn't it? Yeah. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Let's end the meeting. Yeah. Thank you very much.